We will begin with um, selectman announcements and updates. Selectman DeWitt. Oh, very short ones tonight. Um, <clears throat> actually, <laughs> as we speak, downstairs in room 308, the Town Meeting Members Association is holding a moderator's post-mortem discussion on the outcomes of the November Town Meeting. Um, on Thursday this week at 7 p.m. at Wheelock College in the lecture room, the Friends of Fairstead and the Green Space Alliance, among others, are sponsoring a lecture by Boston University Professor Daniel Bluestone. Uh, the title is Dwellings in the Landscape, and it's all about how housing fits into the broader environment. What's interesting to us locally is that there are examples from Brookline that will be a part of this discussion. Um, at the Brookline Art Center, the artist's marketplace with handmade art and craft works will continue this weekend on Saturday and Sunday from noon until 4 p.m. And also there is a set of special classes being offered in a holiday session uh, that will run this week and next week through December 19th. If you want more information, uh, go to www.alloneword.brooklineartcenter.com. And finally, on Sunday afternoon, the Winter Farmer's Market again will be held in the Arcade Building uh, at 318 Harvard Street from noon until 5 p.m. I'm going to add two quick items. Uh, one is I had the uh, pleasure of uh, attending a very wet rededication of the Washington Square oh, yes. uh, clock at 3.30 3, 3 this afternoon. And we thank the Washington Square Merchants Association for all their sure. hard work in getting that uh, important landmark back up and running and very precisely. Uh, I also want to announce, and I had a written document about it, but I think I left it in the other room, that the 20th annual Town Employees Toy Drive is currently going on. They collect uh, new toys, but you don't have to wrap them. You can drop them off at uh, several locations, and th that's where I'm going to have trouble remembering. One I know is the Public Safety Building. One's right. downstairs here in the mail, in the, in the mail, the mail room. The here, and through December 19th, they collect through them. Through December 19th. So uh, please, if you have the uh, will and uh, the generosity, kindly uh, get a new toy and um, help the uh, town employees make uh, Christmas a uh, successful one for people who can't necessarily afford to do it themselves. Any other announcements? Yeah, I'll, I'll mention we had a, a, what I thought was a very successful uh, Gateway uh, East uh, public hearing uh, in conjunction <coughs> with uh, Mass uh, DOT looking at uh, uh, focusing on the bicycle accommodations and uh, a number of citizen groups made some uh, Presentations put a lot of work into uh, coming up with suggestions. I think gave us all some uh, really uh, great ideas, and perhaps uh, there might be some actionable uh, suggestions out of it. Very good. Anything else? Very good. We'll move on then to. Uh, is there, there is pub someone for public comment? Yes. I believe. Mr. Chris. Mr. Chris. <coughs> Hi, uh, my name is Alan Christ. I'm a Lawrence parent and a town meeting member in Precinct 4. I just wanted to voice my support for a fully funded debt exclusion which covers the cost of the devotion renovation as well as an override which meets uh, Superintendent Lupini's long range funding goals for the town schools. A fully funded override will minimize class sizes and allow for adequate support staff and specialist ratios while also funding um, numerous other areas such as K-8 world languages, special education programs, and ELL programs that are critical to maintaining the quality of Brookline School. In addition, a debt exclusion which funds devotion will give the town maximum flexibility to fund future CIP projects at uh, Driscoll, Pierce, Baker, and the high school uh, and, uh, to address the current overcrowding problem. Pro problem sorry. Uh, however, despite my personal support, I'm very concerned that this badly needed override will not pass. Uh, 
As you know, there are many Brookline parents with children in the schools who strongly favor uh, the debt exclusion and override. However, we account for only approximately 20% of the registered voters in the town. In light of this, it's critical for the selectmen to demonstrate in the next few months that the health of our schools is directly tied to the health of the town and that there's a correlation between our schools and our property values. Also, building this understanding can be done in three ways. Um, conducting town-wide surveys, opinion polling, and community outreach to all voters to ensure that adequate data is collected about voter preferences and to ensure that voters will understand the impact of a failed override. The second is broadening the scope of an override slightly so it, it includes issues which concern seniors as well as other residents without children. And the third is developing a pyramid structure for the override which would be similar to the previous Lincoln override as a means to ensure support for at least a basic level of funding if a fully funded or enhanced option does not pass. I st again, to reiterate, I strongly support a fully funded override and I feel that it is an achievable goal if the town begins as soon as possible with these measures to ensure that there's a broad base of support. Many interested parents are willing to help out with uh, this process, but there needs to be a plan in place for us to get on board. Great. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Can I just bri daily? briefly respond to that? Because um, I, I appreciate everything you said, but I, I, I just wanted to let you know that that uh, the town itself, that there's in past overrides, there's been a committee of volunteers set up to disseminate some of that information. We can't actually, I believe we cannot actually um, solicit the voters uh, on behalf of the override. We certainly can provide data and information but I think as as has been done in the past a, a volunteer group is going to have to kind of spearhead the the actual solicitation of votes um, effort because um, le legally I yes. don't believe we can do that okay thank you selectman Daly for pointing that out and let's move on to our miscellaneous calendar First item is the question of appro approving the minutes of the December 2nd meeting, which, uh, by the way, I apologize that I was not here. I had a uh, business obligation that could not be, could not be otherwise uh, dealt with, so. I have given some corrections and amendments to Kate. Anyone else? Good. No others? Okay, well, I move that we uh, <coughs> approve the minutes as amended by Selectman Daly. All in favor say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman DeWitt. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. The chair will abstain and the motion passes, so those minutes <coughs> as amended are approved. Uh, next we need a very brief discussion of our upcoming meeting schedule, specifically around the holidays. Uh, Mr. Kleckner, you want to? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the question initially was whether or not the board should meet on the Tuesday of December 23rd and December 30th. Uh, they both fall nearby the, the, the uh, holidays. And my thought was that given all of the uh, responsibilities and um, deadlines associated with the override that it might not be um, prudent for the board to skip two full weeks during, during this period of time. Um, so that's really the issue. Another issue came up yesterday that um, next week's meeting is on the uh, fir first uh, evening of Hanukkah and so I raised that issue because one person who wanted to participate in the meeting indicated that they would not because of that reason. Um, so those are the two issues. Um. So my personal belief, my personal calendar is that I don't think I'm going to be here on December 22nd. I w do plan to be back here, I'm sorry, on the 23rd. I do plan to be here on December 30th. So for, for my purposes, skipping the uh, December 23rd meeting uh, and keeping the December 30th meeting would, would make the most sense. And, uh, you know, while the first night of Hanukkah, I can remember this board meeting in the past on the first night of Hanukkah, it is an important family night for, for, for some families. And I'm thinking if we're going to be missing the 23rd meeting, maybe moving our weekly meeting to the Thursday night. Might, might be uh, Thursday the 18th. Thursday, yeah, the 18th, exactly. So I don't know how people feel about that. Do you have a, um, a zoning board meeting that night, 
Allison, are they, do they typically, will they be meeting in this room? Uh, they do have a short meeting on the 18th. Um, it should be over by 7.30. We could, well, we what could What about the 17th? Is the second night of Hanukkah important? <coughs> no, not far, so much? Far, far less so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I, I mean, I don't like to exclude anyone, yeah. but. Um, um, yeah, so what about the 16th then? Wednesday. No, the 16th is Tuesday. We'd be I'm looking sorry. at 17th Excuse Wednesday me. or 17th. Or eight, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm fine for the 17th. I'm fine with the 17th. <coughs> I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay, so I think that. Let me just double check my calendar. I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, so that's next week's meeting, including the executive session, which we just discussed. Mr. Kleckner uh, will be uh, on December. On Wednesday, Wednesday the seventeenth, December seventeenth, <laughs> and there'll be no meeting on uh, for the week of December twenty second, including no meeting on December twenty third, which is the usual Tuesday night. We will schedule a meeting for the <coughs> evening of December thirtieth, the Tuesday night. Okay. Moving on, uh, item C on our miscellaneous calendar is the question of approving a transfer within the Planning uh, and Community Development Department. Ms. Steinfeld. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Allison Steinfeld, Planning Director. As you know, the town hired Maria Morelli to provide professional and administrative support relative to the 40B application submitted by Chestnut Hill Realty. Uh, Ms. Morelli has been doing an extraordinary job on behalf of the town. Uh, her attention to detail has resulted in a process that has been transparent and that has run, quite honestly, rather smoothly. Um, her professional support has far exceeded our expectations. She's coordinated all of our interdepartmental review and has herself reviewed all of the plans, all of the technical reports, and provided an extraordinary amount of input not only to the planning department but all of the departments involved. However, it's been a year. Um, we've had seven extensions, and our contract funds have, term have run out for Ms. Morelli. Um, I ther am therefore requesting that you authorize an extension of her contract, a nominal increase in her hourly rate by $3, and a total increase in her contract by $12,600. These funds are available um, as a result of vacancies in uh, the planning department. Questions from board members? No, I, I will just say that while I have complained about many things throughout this Hancock Village process, I do think uh, Ms. Morelli has been doing a very good job. And I agree with that. I agree. Okay. Uh, well, seeing no objection, then I move that we uh, authorize the transfer uh, in the Department of Planning and Community Development budget from the payroll account in the amount of $12,600 to the professional service, services account in that same amount. All in favor say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman DeWitt. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Chair votes aye. And I further move that we approve and execute a contract amendment in the amount of $12,600 with Maria Morelli for professional services relative to the Chestnut Hill Realty 40B application. All in favor say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman DeWitt. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Chair votes aye. Uh, we've got one. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. We have uh, four temporary alcoholic beverage licenses. I'll take them all together. I move that we approve. A, the following uh, temporary alcoholic beverage licenses, uh, and these are all um, uh, are these all kinds. Yeah, they're all all kinds of alcohol. Uh, December 12th from 5:30 p.m. to 11 p.m. at uh, and by the way, these are all at the um, Auto Museum, 15 Newton Street. December 12th, 5:30 to 11 p.m. for a rehearsal dinner. December 17th for a holiday luncheon from 12 noon to 5 p.m. December 18th for the Harvard Business Dinner at 5:30 to 10:30 p.m. And December 19th for a Health Edge holiday party, 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. All in favor say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Dewitt. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Chair votes aye. Next, we have some boards and commission mm. interviews, and the first is a, uh, in, a uh, applicant for our Complete Street Study Committee. Is Gus Streisand here? I think I saw him. Come on, it. Come on forward, Gus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Good evening. Good evening, Gus. Tell us, you volunteer for a lot of things, I think everybody knows you, but tell us a little bit why you're interested specifically in the Complete Streets Study Committee and what you uh, hope to bring to that committee. Uh, well, I think I can probably bring quite a bit of experience to uh, Complete Streets because for my work environment, I've been working at the same firm, which is BSC Group, about since 19, 1998. Uh, on similar kinds of projects, um, we have done work in uh, Belmont, similar kinds of work, where we really put great emphasis on uh, the promotion of walking, bicycling, and other modes of transportation. And I think I can bring with the other projects with that I've worked in the town, such as uh, uh, at the Palm Dev, I have participated in. Uh, also in the traffic, in the establishment of the <coughs> traffic counting policy and procedures manual. I think I can bring quite a bit of experience and also maybe a more engineering approach to this committee. All right. Questions for Gus. Did you say you worked with Belmont on this, uh, on, the on the complete road. streets? I think it's, well, there's not complete streets, but I think it's an old topic project, but I think uh, at the moment it's under construction and it is one of those arterial projects we have uh, by two lanes in each direction, parking on each side, lots of commercial, st commercial development on all these different streets. So I, I think therefore really bringing sensitivity to and uh, sensitivity to the interest of all users to that project and to the town. Got it. All right. You're pretty familiar with the, the statute itself, the Complete well, Streets Well, familiar. Program. I know that the Complete Streets has, uh, Mass DOT has set aside $20 million uh, for a four, over a four-year period, so that is, there is $5 million for each, for most towns, or for towns who have provide an application process, as well as, I think one of the requirements is also that you have to have a policy manual in place, and I think this is one of the fairly early requirements for that. Good. Any other questions for <coughs> us? Uh, only just to be sure that Transportation Board doesn't come into conflict with the Complete Street Study Committee as far as your time is concerned. I don't think that will be an issue. I, I didn't well, think Mr. so. Well, Mr. Englander, who, um, who I know. proposed the Complete yeah, Streets right. Committee, um, is also a member of the Transportation Board. I know, and that board. means and we'll have, well, I guess what I'm worrying about is if the whole Transportation Board joins Complete Streets, what happens <laughs> no, anyway? I don't think that's well, we have, like, two that. applicants from the Transportation yeah, Board. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, yeah, I'm, I'm just concerned uh, that we get a balance board with a, with a balance of viewpoints, a balance of skills. Uh, sure. The, the one thing that I can bring is really is like the experience with that kind of work as well as maybe my PE license and uh, having worked a lot of work, done a lot of stuff in town. Right. Hopefully that helps. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Gus. Appreciate you. your time. Nick Schmidt. Come on up, Nick. Tell us about yourself and why you're interested. Well, I'm, the good thing is I'm not on a board. So yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and I want to apologize. I'm kind of recovering from a weird flu-like thing, so I've got a cough drop in my mouth. But anyway, yeah, I, I'm relatively new to Brookline. I've lived here since May 2013. Um, I moved previously from Atlanta, and then I've lived in D.C. and from Georgia, so I've been kind of bouncing around. I'm actually a, uh, I'm a multimodal planner at Parsons Brinkerhoff. I've been planning for about six and a half years now from all sorts of modes, from motor vehicles, buses, uh, rapid transit, to um, uh, commuter rail, freight rail, uh, pedestrian cyclists. So I, I think I can come at this from a, you know, a nice multimodal perspective. So I, I'm interested in this not only you know, because I work with this sort of subject, but I'm also interested in this because I like Brookline a lot. I moved here specifically for transportation purposes and the quality of life that it offers. Yeah. I'm from the south where we don't really have many great options on how to get around. You don't have snow either. <laughs> That's true. Uh, well, when we do, we freak out if it's like interesting. Yeah. Uh, the snow that was just, I guess it was yesterday, that would have that would have shut Atlanta down for like three years. Um, so so I'm also, I'm, I'm interested in being on this committee, you know, from a personal standpoint too, because I, I think this is a really great time for this to happen in the town. I think that a lot of people like myself are um, looking for a more complete multimodal transportation system. Um, there's a lot of um, 
there's a lot of demographic, shi demographic shifts going on right now in how people view transportation and what they want out of it. And so, you know, I, I think I can come at it from that perspective, um, both professionally and, you know, personally, in my personal life. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm just I'm glad to be a potential part of this. And if I can help out in any way, I would love to be a part of the process. Very good. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Schmidt? Well, I, I actually thought his, um, I, I saw some of the articles and things he'd done which seemed to be um, very closely related. Is there anything that you've done that was a complete streets kind of uh, project or activity up yeah. till now? Yeah, um, I actually just completed a complete streets project. Uh -huh. Okay. in Burlington, Vermont. Ah, so all right. In the time, I, it's kind of odd. In the time I've lived here, in the year and a half I've lived here, I've actually, I work in Boston, but I've, I've been working primarily in Vermont. You and, travel. And Rhode Island. <laughs> yeah. Got well, it. At least, you know, via email and sometimes, you know, traveling in person. But, but yeah, we, we just completed a, uh, a project for Complete Streets for North Avenue in, in uh, oh, Burlington. Oh, okay. Great. Suckman so Daly? Yeah, I just, I just want to ask you, are you a bicyclist, Mr. Schmidt? I do ride my bike, yes. Okay, because I, I just have one concern. We have a lot of bicyclists who are very active on, right. with the Transportation Board and on a separate committee, as, or, but also among members of the Transportation Board. And I, I'm on the Council on Aging in town, and I, I can tell you that some of the senior citizens feel like bicyclists are getting... Um, Lots of attention and pedestrians not not enough. So I'm I'm a, yeah, a, uh, a little concerned on the complete streets that people um, uh, pay attention to pedestrians as well. And I noticed you were on some committee in Georgia, I think, that was a bicycle and pedestrian program. Right. What my, right? my first internship through in college was actually for the Georgia Department of Transportation's bicycle and pedestrian program. Okay. Right. Yeah. No, I guess to respond to that. I, I think that's a that's a good point. I, I think generally a lot of a lot of people are really, well, how should I phrase this? I think bikes get a lot of attention because they're not very well accounted for in our transportation system. So I think there's a lot of you know a lot of striving for it, including that. But but I agree that it does create some sort of conflicts, especially intersections, with how you deal with people interacting at crosswalks or with right turns. Um, to answer your question, I I. I I do ride my bike, but I also, like I said, I, I moved here. I actually moved here specifically, of all the places within Boston, yeah. specifically in Brookline, to be at, at Coolidge Corner, to be at the crossroads of the 66 <laughs> and the Green Line. Oh. So I, I, I can, I'm, a, I'm able to think, you know, big picture. Um, I understand the conflicts. I understand how things can work together. I, I walk, I walk everywhere I can. I ride my bike to work when the weather's nice. Not today. Um, you know, I, I ride the train to work. I ride the bus to Cambridge. Okay, and you're complete. Yeah, I, I'm. <laughs> He's multimodal. I'm very multi. I, well, that's sort of, yeah, I, I was yeah. sort of thinking about how to, to best sort of express that sentiment, but I, yeah. I guess I do live a very multimodal sort of complete streets life um, <laughs> personally, and so, you know, and also I have that sort of professional background and knowledge. Thank you. Anything further? Well, we're not going to make a decision tonight. We always are very happy to see new people getting involved, fresh ideas. So uh, thank you very much for thank you. I appreciate putting your name out there. Speak. Thanks. Todd Washburn. Same committee, same question. Tell us about yes, yourself, indeed. Todd, and why thank you're you. interested. Thank you. For, uh, thanks for having me. Um, I've had a longstanding personal interest in urban planning and urban design issues. Um, in the concept of how you create um, pedestrian friendly vibrant communities that work for local economies and I think help civic engagement um, unlike our previous speaker I don't have a professional background in this area um, but the long-standing personal interest means you know I often find myself especially attracted to news articles blog posts you know on urban planning um, on interesting ideas for multimodal transportation um, and that sort of thing. I am also a bike commuter and a bus commuter. I was going to say, do you um, take the 66 too? <laughs> do you take the 66 bus? And uh, again, one of my reasons for moving to Brookline now, 11 years ago, um, you know, I often say to people, uh, and my wife too, it, uh, we didn't choose our dream house, we chose our dream location. Um, and it was access to transit and walkable communities uh, that was critical for us. And, I thought it was um, because you're 
your last name is Washburn and you were yes, on Washburn no. Terrace. <laughs> I thought that's why you picked your address. That is, yeah. That's a secondary reason. Yeah. That, that was important as well. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yes, I know that's an amazing coincidence. Um, so, so those are those are the uh, those are the main reasons. I think you know, a, as a bike commuter and a walker and a bus rider. Um, they, you know, I'm often thinking about how all of these things fit together. I do take your point, uh, Selectman Daly, about um, bikes perhaps getting, feel, feeling to some people like bikes get too much attention. Um, I do feel... I want to say I'm, I'm not anti-bike, you know, but, yeah, but, I, I, but I, I don't, and I, I have occasionally heard this from bicycle riders, that it's okay to go through red lights if they don't see any cars coming. And I can tell you that scares some of the senior citizens. I can tell you um, as a, both a bike rider and a driver, I also have a car, um, I am as frustrated as you are by bicyclists who don't follow the rules. Um, I'm also sympathetic to the idea that most of the rules were designed with cars in mind. You know, and so that's part of what I see Complete Streets being about is finding those balances, recognizing that streets are designed for all of us, for pedestrians, for bicyclists, for cars, for freight, in Brookline for, trans for public transportation. And uh, as, I, as I understand it, that's really what Complete Streets is about, is to making, making our streets work for everyone. Great. Selectman Franco. Uh, thank you for your application, sure. and I note that you have a, uh, a PhD in political science, so I'm going to ask you a <laughs> political science question. Yes, indeed. Um, the sort of a most immediate challenge with this committee is actually developing this complete street policy. Right. Um, a looming challenge is to implement it, and I wonder if you've given any thought to the best way to deliver an implementable uh, policy and sort of how we can yeah. get from sort of the, the, the policy we want to see implemented to actual implementation. Right. Well, I think a couple of things. I think a vision is critical. Um, I think that you've got to set a, a, uh, a series of key priorities that are attainable and achievable. Um, I think, too, that a vision can be a guide to not just the big picture, but a series of small things. Um, you know, again, in my biking life, I notice, for instance, just when streets have been repaved in Brookline in the last decade or so, often a bike lane is added. No other changes are made to the street, just a simple bike lane is added, and it makes an enormous difference to me as both a driver and a biker. And I think, again, just laying out a vision that our streets <coughs> can and should be multimodal, um, can and should work for everyone, can guide everything from very big decisions, which may take a lot of effort and coordination between a lot of different agencies, to very simple decisions like, hey, we're repaving the street, we're going to add a bike lane. Um, so I really, that's, I, you know, there's a million ways to answer your question, um, but, but vision drives policy, it drives regulation, it drives statute, and all of those things are critical, I think, to making, again, to making streets work for everybody. Thank you. Anything further for Mr. Washburn? Did you figure out? I mean, was the name, street named after an ancestor I, or somebody it, related? We have not to figured it out. I'm yeah. not sure, but I have been asked that question many times. And, and <laughs> now that my kids are getting older and I have a little more time, I'm going to research it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. You'll be Thank hearing you. from us soon. Uh, I don't see Gidi Saidi in here. Dwayne, no, but Mr. Tyndall is. Oh, it's not on my well, yeah, not on my oh, calendar. Oh, sorry. We had an update. Uh, no, uh, sorry. sorry. All right. Um, Dwayne Tyndall for the Diversity Inclusion Community Relations Commission. Good evening, Mr. Tyndall. Good evening. Would you uh, in introduce yourself? Tell us about yourself and why you're interested in serving on the commission. Oh, my name is Dwayne Tyndall. I've been in Brookline around 11 years. Um, all of my children, three of them, is in Brookline schools. Well, my daughter graduated from Brookline High last year. Um, why I'm interested? Because um, I have an interest in um, equity issues and civil rights, and, and I think Brookline has the potential of being really close to trying to live up to some of my ideals. So that's the reason why. Good. Questions for Mr. Tindor? 
Can you tell us um, what do you do for a living? Um, I'm, I'm the manager of education and outreach for the Fair Housing Center in Greater Boston, which is basically um, a HUD-funded civil rights organization. So I provide education outreach to community groups and municipalities around affirmatively, fur affirmatively furthering fair housing policies and and um, other fair housing issues to um, various community groups. Thank you. Selectman Daly. Um, you've mentioned in, on your application that you're particularly interested in, in, you know, how Brookline recruits and maybe helping the town rethink that process, which is great. But I'm surprised you didn't mention uh, the fair housing stuff. Are you interested in, because uh, that is one of the m missions of the the, that was the old and the new diversity mm -hmm. commission was uh, the fair housing area. So is that something you'd be interested in, in um, uh, guiding your fellow members to do some work on? Or yeah, I mean, one is the is the law of the land, <laughs> and two, um, I think some of the um, issues with some of the discrimination, just the lack of knowledge and the lack of information regarding. <laughs> fair housing laws mm -hmm. and regulations so um, it's, it's a constant reorientation relative to reminding people and teaching people about fair housing and how fair housing really made our society a better society a more mm -hmm. equitable society mm -hmm. so yes I would be interested to kind of move that process forward um, as a matter of fact we have quite a few um, trainings with various realtors in Brookline so and we work with the bureaucracy some the planning department around some fair housing issues and so forth so relative to our organization we come in contact with Brookline often mm -hmm. and just if we could just kind of get that vertical integration relative to thinking about fair housing um, mm -hmm. that would be uh, I think a benefit to Brookline Town do, do, we, do we have a redlining problem in Brookline in your viewpoint? And we have a redlining problem in the United States. Yeah. And, uh, and you still see a lot of staring, um, a lot of discrimination based on ethnicity, gender, familiar status, source of income. Some of it is based out of not knowing. Other is some really bad old habits that we still have. Yeah. So redlining and, um, and that level of discrimination is still, it's a regional issue, but it's also is an issue relative that we're still dealing with in our country. Do you know if there's been a test done in our community recently? I know from time to time HUD will send um, out. Uh, I don't have any knowledge of any systemic tests in the Brookline yeah, area. Yeah, I, I, I know um, <coughs> Newton did some not too long ago, but um, I, I don't, at least from what I know of our mm -hmm. former Human Relations Commission, now Diversity Commission, I don't think there's been any done in Brookline, at least not unless your guys did it without sort of connecting with the local. We haven't, I don't, <laughs> I don't have any knowledge of any systemic tests on Brookline. Um, sometimes we conduct systemic tests. And, um, but not, I don't have any direct knowledge of systemic tests on Brookline. No. Okay. Uh, for the questions from Mr. Tyndall. No? Well, I know that you're not exactly new to town government, you're a town meeting me member, but. Yes. You know, and he's a, he was also on the former Human Relations right. Commission. Right, so yes. right. So not new to this. Yeah. But <coughs> I'm happy to see you putting your name in for this too, Dwayne. <coughs> Yeah, in fact, I would say we look forward to seeing a newly re-energized, charged human relations. Diversity. Actually, diversity. diversity. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I'm, I totally got it wrong. I apologize for that. The spirit but is the same. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. Right. We'd like to see it really take on an active role and um, be re-energized. So, anyway. Uh, and I believe that um, the next go-round with a little clearer bylaws and direction that we will be able to do that. Yeah. Good. Great. Great. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you. <coughs> uh, now I'll, I'll recognize that Gidi Seedian does not appear to be in the room. Uh, Jerry Hayes is here. Oh, no, that's not. 
No, she's not here. I know her. I know her when I see her. So, uh, so we'll move on to uh, Gerard Hayes, uh, who is an applicant for reappointment to the trustees of the Walnut Hill Cemetery. <coughs> Mr. Hayes, good to see you. Nice to see you. Nice to be here. I have a five-five minute talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No PowerPoint. Uh, no PowerPoint. <laughs> Uh, well, tell us uh, about what you've been up to and why you want to be reappointed. Well, at the uh, uh, Cemetery of Trustees is a more interesting board than you might have thought. Mm. Uh, <laughs> it has an interesting history which I've looked into and uh, um, I, I must say that the present company uh, excluded. You folks are, are assembling a, a marvelous and outstanding board of trustees uh, with folks that you have appointed and, and will appoint and it's just such a real pleasure. Uh, to work with them. I think I bring a different um, linkage to segments in the community and a different interest that will complement uh, these other folks and uh, look forward to working with them uh, as we go down as we go down the road uh, in the next three years should you decide to uh, reappoint me. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Hayes. I just wonder if you see any particular issues that uh, the trustees have facing them? Well, I mean it's always money. Yeah, and, uh, the size money. Well, uh, including that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No surprise. Uh, I think it's um, planning for the long-term future uh, and, and trying to make sure that we have uh, uh, provisions for folks for the long term. Um, and uh, one of the things that I'm interested in looking at is what other cemeteries are doing uh, in, in that um, area. Um, I think uh, sooner or later we will run out of the current situation uh, and we need to make a plan. And um, I think that's probably um, the big issue facing them. Because um, I, I know some of the older sections are, I think, uh, no longer have space. Is that They're right? Sold out. Yeah, yeah, right. That's what I thought. Good. Any other questions for Mr. Hayes? I know you've been doing a good job, and uh, we'll be making a decision on this relatively soon. Fine. Thank you. Thank you for coming out on this rainy night. Appreciate it. Uh, moving on, we're uh, up to agenda item number seven, and it's the question of establishing a cable television advisory committee. Selectman Wyshynski, do you want to talk about this? Or? Um, it's your baby, isn't it? I guess so. All right. Good. Um, we're... Um, <coughs> going to be renewing the Comcast license and also the RCA license. No. no, just Comcast? Yep. So uh, I guess uh, this uh, group will help guide uh, us in that process and uh, work with uh, the big uh, uh, folks and uh, hopefully come up with a good uh, uh, <coughs> renewal. Okay. I just had one question as you're renaming this and naming it the um, Cable Television Advisory Committee. I, I, you know, I'm wondering if we're not soon about to launch beyond <laughs> cable television to be nice. Yeah, something. Well, you know, we the had next um, technology the, or prior, the prior iteration of this, and it wasn't quite exactly, but it was called the Broadband Monitoring right. Committee. Mm -hmm. um, well, if you can think of a better word, it's fine with me. Um, they are, I think, in the law, it continues to be referred to as a cable television license. Okay. I mean, I think the the factor that subjects them to our jurisdiction mm -hmm. is the fact that they've laid cables in our streets still. Yeah, right. And so I think it still is about cable, even though media is a lot more than cable right now. Yeah. <coughs> Okay. Well, and although... I just wondered if we were updating the, the name, if we didn't want to jump ahead. To the I text. think both, both Comcast and RCN uh, continue to be, quote, cable providers, as opposed to fiber optic, which, although I know there's some conversion going on, I don't think they've done it. I'll, I'll, I'll also note that the, uh, the composition of the committee uh, is recommended to include uh, our... Uh, CIO, Chief right. Information Officer, who, along with uh, myself, certainly will bring a, uh, uh, a real awareness of uh, broadband and that whole uh, side of things, because that's something I'm very interested in. Okay. And uh, I should note, too, that we'll be seeking two citizen appointees to this committee if it uh, passes this 
difficult vote here. <laughs> I just want to make sure that uh, one of the charges of this committee will be to monitor company compliance. Is the vision for this um, committee to continue to monitor compliance subsequent to the negotiation of a contract, or is this sort of a two-year effort and then it's going to lay dormant until we renew again? I think the focus is going to be around the um, the renewal process, but um, the re the um, you know I do believe that we should. I think that was part of the broadband monitoring committee's charge, and I think I think that should be an ongoing responsibility. And perhaps we'll modify the charge to make that clearer. It seems to me that we should continue to hold people accountable yeah. to what they agree to, um, right. right? In between negotiating. <coughs> uh, yeah, I do see this as a standing committee and one that would uh, continue. Uh, to uh, operate between the license renewal process. Possibly even changing its name at some future date. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I don't think we need to read the charge here, but uh, I'm going to move that we establish the Commercial <coughs> Television Advisory Committee uh, and charge it according to the, um, the uh, submission seven in our packet tonight. All in favor say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman DeWitt. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Chair, the chair votes aye. Thank you. Uh, moving on to uh, agenda item number eight. That's our tax cl classification um, <coughs> motion. And this is a continuation of the hearing which happened last week. Mr. McCabe. Uh, good evening. Uh, excuse me. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm Gary McCabe here representing the Board of Assessors. And tonight, following up on last week's uh, presentation regarding uh, tax classification options uh, for the board for the uh, fiscal year, current fiscal year 15, um, where I'm available to answer any questions you may have tonight after uh, reviewing the material. Um, I can tell you that uh, the uh, prior boards of selectmen have adopted tax classification over the years. Uh, in the range of uh, a commercial factor of between 1.72 and 1.75. Uh, also, uh, at this time, uh, there's an opportunity to vote on the residential exemption, uh, which I'd ask that you uh, consider again this year so that that program could move forward. Uh, the selectmen in uh, prior years have uh, regularly adopted that um, at the maximum 20%. Uh, so those are, you know, those, I think those are the highlights uh, in front of us. Uh, again, the, um, the importance of uh, this vote is that our tax rates will come out of it. Uh, and I say tax rates because we'll have uh, dual tax rates. Um, currently, the uh, residential, what we call the residential tax rate is $11.39 per $1,000 of assessment. And the uh, commercial rate is $18.50. Uh, with the change in our tax base, an increase overall in our tax base of some 10%, uh, uh, the tax rates will go down. Um, although our tax levy uh, will increase uh, some uh, three and a half uh, to 3.7%, I think is the number. So, you know, there's a number of, of factors here, and, and you, know, you know, your vote sort of ties it all together, <coughs> what the rates will be. So. Um, if you have any questions about the material or about you know what happens from here uh, with uh, you know with your vote, um, I did bring uh, a form that you'll have to sign following your vote. I'll leave that uh, with the uh, uh, with Kate. Good. Well, I apologize again that I wasn't here for the discussion of this last week, but I want to assure everybody I read through the book uh, completely, so I think I've got a pretty good grasp on where I'd like to see this headed. Selectman Franco? There were some proposed votes in our packet this week, yep. and I note that some of the, uh, at the bottom of some of these votes, it, it says uh, excess levy capacity, and there are different figures depending on the tax rate. I'm just wondering if you could walk us through what excess levy capacity means. Sure, uh, Selectman Franco, I'll be happy to do that. The uh, levy limit is the first thing we calculate year over year. And the uh, tax levy limit is a formula based um, on, or starting um, with the prior year's levy limit. So we look to uh, the prior year fiscal, in this case fiscal year 14, uh, levy limit, we had 2.5%, and then any allowable um, levy growth, which this year was $2.1 million, 
Um, and then uh, any uh, debt exclusion, we currently still have a debt exclusion at 1.9 million. So we know our new levy limit. We can calculate that. All right. Then um, once we determine what uh, tax rate we'd like to apply, we then have to test that rate. So we test that rate back against <coughs> the tax base and recalculate the levy. So that recalculated levy, uh, actual, call it the actual tax levy, is compared to that limit. If, if it's below the limit, the difference is excess levy capacity. Because you'll never get exactly to the limit. And the reason we won't is because the tax rate is expressed in dollars and cents and nothing beyond that. So it's, you know, it's not $18.50.65 cents. It's $18.50 cents. So with that of dollars and cents rounding, you'll never get to the mathematical levy limit. Uh, some of the choices uh, that you have uh, in the classification vote result in tax rates that put us over the levy limit. So those choices are not available. Um, and I've tried to outline those. So you either have too much or too little. Um, you know, it'd be unusual to have um, a tax rate applied against the tax base that got you right to your levy limit. Uh, follow up, um, Slack and Franco, is we don't lose that levy uh, that ability to, to tax to that amount, it carries us forward next year. Again, the levy limit is the base, not the actual levy. But so if for, for the next year. But if, for example, we go at 1.72, the excess levy capacity that we're leaving on the table is just under $59,000 versus 175, where the excess is about 9000 so while it's not affecting our base going forward, it's, it's we're, we're, we're not funding a teacher or right. in effect, <coughs> it's cash that we're not, we're not right. maximizing mm -hmm. the amount of revenue. Right. We would for, revenue forego account. collecting Correct. those dollars. This year. Correct. This year. Right. Very small amount. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, you know, the tax, the amount of the tax, um, overall tax levy um, compared to the excess capacity, exactly. The, the excess right. capacity is a, a small fraction of, of the levy. Right. right. But in any case, <coughs> I think uh, I'm just reiterating what, um, <coughs> excuse me, Mr. McCabe has said. We will still be reducing the rate for both the residential, I mean, assuming that we agree on the exemption, will continue, um, our options will still reduce the rate over last year, the current, well, the prior fiscal year. Prior fiscal year. Right. This, uh, second daily. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to recommend that we um, set the residential exemption at the 20%, as we historically have done. Mm -hmm. And, and um, uh, although I hate to leave the 58000 on the table, I'm, I'm going to recommend that we go with 1.72 because um, the um, this year uh, the because of the revaluation, it, the the values of commercial properties have gone up significantly, and so the the tax is skewed toward them anyway. So to to go to uh, a higher number than we have been at the last couple of years, um, I think would be yet another burden on the the commercial and we did hear from the Chamber of Commerce that they were okay with this number mm-hmm I'm in agreement I, I have one question before we go to the vote what, what, can Chairman you quickly explain to me why three families are seem are kind of an anomaly here that's a very good question why three families um, didn't increase it, it, in value at the rate that the the community did as a whole. Uh, uh, to put some numbers to that, year over year, the assessments of three families increased approximately 5%. So there was an increase in the assessed <coughs> value of our three family homes. But overall, the, the assessed value of the community increased 10%. Any, so any group, and in this case, the three families, if, if that group's increase isn't equal to the, to the average for the community, then taxes are shifted away from that group, all right? But why, why, did, uh, uh, why was there only a 5% increase? 
Uh, we talked a little bit about this uh, last week. The, the three family stock, we'll say, that's left in town that hasn't um, been converted to condominiums, on average is 108 years old, mm -hmm. all right? The, uh, many of those uh, are row uh, buildings. The three families are, that are still three families are interior, um, interior uh, parcels within a, within a row. It, it, it isn't that they're, they're um, um, undesirable properties. Certainly they are for, for many. Um, but they're the group that um, is left, so to speak, the, you know, the, the, uh, the three families that haven't been converted um, are probably not as desirable as the ones that have been sold in prior years for conversion. So that, you know, that market isn't um, as hot as some other properties are. And, you know, that 5% increase reflects that. Got it. So, uh, you know, there's, there's other groups. There's, um, you know, sort of the, the, uh, uh, the properties that trade less, less frequently, um, like th three families, average three families, um, you know, fell behind this market a little bit. Uh, there's a number of other factors. Uh, they tend to be on the busier streets, for example. So, um, you know, if you're looking at uh, a property to purchase in, in Brookline, it's probably not the first property you're going to look at. Right. Good. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I'd like so to make Mishinsky. a pitch for the 1.715. And yes, yeah. while the uh, Chamber of Commerce said um, they're okay with 172, I, 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 I don't think we should give up the fifty thousand dollars. You know, we're we're looking at uh, a, a cut of fifty thousand dollars in the library budget, right. and they're telling us that's material. So I, I think, I, th I think it's material that uh, you know every every penny counts. And and looking at the actual tax rates and the effects on the taxpayers, um, I, I think. Um, it, it's not very material. Uh, so for single families, instead of uh, the, 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 the median having a $4 increase, they'll have an $18 increase. Um, for uh, uh, condos, the median will have, instead of a $189, will have a $193 increase. And, 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 and for the uh, commercial, it's, you know, it's it's within a hundred dollars for for the median. So um, I, I I'd like to see us uh, try and get uh, go go up to our levy limit. I agree with Selectman Wyshynski. We're we're in a climate where we're talking about uh, making reductions or uh, seeking efficiencies, uh, and I'm not inclined to leave uh, money on the table, so to speak. I think we should try and. Um, collect uh, up to the limit and, uh, um, and and it seems like in this case it's reasonable it's not a, a huge difference between um, the uh, burden on the single family owner and just to be clear the rate on commercial would be dropping from 1850 to 1739 um, which seems to me is quite a reasonable thing well I want, to, I want to counterpoint that, and that is, you know, it's very likely we're going to be asking people for an override here very shortly, and uh, and um, and that burden is going to be ha felt heavily by a lot of our residential owners more than our commercial owners, and um, I'm not sure, even a, even a token gesture at this point of uh, it, it seems to me to be important. I have to agree with Ken on this one. Um, yeah, I, I hate to, I hate to leave the fifty thousand dollars on the table, but I, I do think that, um, and and based on some emails I saw, and I think people sort of expected me we might stick with the one seven two, and I suspect we would have heard from a lot more homeowners if we were talking about further shifting. Um, you know, toward homeowners paying more and businesses paying less. I, I don't know. I just think from a sort of PR point of view, it's, it's small dollars. But when, you're, when we're going to be asking for a major override, I'm, I'm, you know, when people are calculating what is my tax cost going to be 
uh, you know, they're adding in $20 instead of $4. Uh, I, I, it, it's largely symbolic, but I'm, I'm with Ken on this one. Sounds like it's going to be up to you, Selectman DeWitt. So, uh, well, Select <laughs> Selectman <laughs> Daly made the first uh, motion, so I think we'll take that motion. And to repeat it, Selectman Daly's motion was, well, do you want to read it? Yes, to, um, well, I, should I well, do it separately? Yeah, okay. let's do the, the um, yeah. residential exemption, okay. exemption separately, please. I hereby move that the Board of Selectmen vote to adopt a residential factor of 0.918516, which represents a CIP factor of 1.72, and the following corresponding tax rates, residential, $10.67, commercial, $17.44. All those in favor say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman DeWitt? No. Selectman Wyshynski? No. Selectman Franco? No. Chair votes aye. So I'll entertain an ultimate, alternate motion. Okay. I'll hereby move that the Board of Selectmen vote to adopt the residential factor of point <coughs> 919082, which represents a CIP factor of 1.0. 715 and the and the following corresponding tax rates residential 1068 commercial 1739 so, uh, so we have the motion all those in favor say aye selectman daly aye selectman dewitt aye selectman wachinski aye selectman franco aye chair votes aye and then um, we also need a motion for Selectman Daly. Why don't you do that yeah, one Yeah, then I, I move that we um, set the residential ex exemption at 20% for fiscal year 2015. Any discussion or counter motions on that? All in favor say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman DeWitt. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank and you, Chairman Goldstein. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Appreciate your, uh, this report is, is very it's dense and difficult, but it's readable and understandable in the, in the long run. Well, thank you. And we're available uh, going forward to try to answer any questions that you or taxpayers may have about these new tax rates. Uh, I do have one question. I mean, it's really a <coughs> sort of an implementation. Excuse me. Um, since we are more and more um, encouraging people to go to the website, will you be able to publish the vote of the Board of Selectmen and one of your um, charts that measures the impact yes. and put it up on the web? Yes, we, we will. That well, would be very tomorrow. good. Right. Good. Right. Fantastic. Right. Great. They, uh, be happy to do that. Um, Selectmen do it. I also want to tell you that, that your vote will be submitted to uh, the Department of Revenue, along with the rest of the tax rate recapitulation right. forms, it shows we have a balanced budget, we have adequate reserves, and that sort of thing. So the rate won't actually be approved for probably you know a week or so. Right. Okay. Well, maybe you should. I don't know. You could publish it as the vote of the Board of yeah. Selectmen, and then confirm whether or not DOR has it's approved. Pending, you know, yeah. pending approval. Right. right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're five minutes early, but it's not a public hearing, so I think we can start our discussion of implications of a no override scenario as part of our overall discussion of the override study committee report. And Mr. Kleckner will start us off. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. This evening, um, we are engaging in a, in a series, in a long series of conversations we've had about the override study committee report and its recommendations uh, as a uh, process to get to a decision by this board uh, next month, uh, which would uh, determine the amount or the form of the question uh, of an override and a debt exclusion. And so <clears throat> one of the questions that the board obviously wants to understand is what would happen if this override did not pass? Uh, now, we have stated the purposes of this override, which are generally a school-related override, uh, but um, 
the question of what would happen if it doesn't pass is somewhat of a different question, and we want to address that this evening. So um, one of the things I'd, li I'd like to do is um, just to uh, review with you some of our basic assumptions about um, the override and the expenditures that would be covered by the override. And we continually look at this uh, chart that, or this uh, table that's in front of you, which represents what we see as the three-year. We're looking at this as a, essentially a three-year plan where uh, we would uh, say that the guarantee that the override would cover us for at least these three years. Um, and uh, so there's a couple of assumptions that, uh, that go into this, and these have been worked on throughout the fall. And as you recall, we have um, updated these numbers somewhat. Uh, there's two things I want to mention about these numbers. Um, first of all, uh, the town has modified the school town partnership formula again. The idea, I think, going into the override was that all of the enrollment uh, credit, if you will, would be borne by the school department in the override. But uh, in an effort to bring the override number down, we have again committed to um, give the school department credit for 50% of the projected enrollment cost. And that results in a lower, generally, override. Now, there are some numbers that have gone up as well. You remember the 1% versus 2% collective bargaining approach, and that has changed. But um, essentially, we're looking here at uh, $12.33 million over three years that would incorporate as well um, the uh, non-tax revenue and the uh, municipal expenditures that we talked about a couple weeks ago. One more point I want to make about these numbers is um, we believe that it is appropriate to move the leases that we are currently engaged in to uh, offload some of our, um, our classroom capacity. Primarily, it's the, uh, the early education program, the BEAT program. Uh, we are renting a number of facilities in town. And uh, those costs are current or were, I think, expected to be part of the override as well. We think it's better to move those over to the, to the capital plan. And uh, there will be some impact on the debt exclusion, but we think it's more appropriate. And that bring, has brought the number down somewhat as well. So uh, really, um, the components of the, um, of the override, um, let, let me go back one slide and tell you the, the, the components of this override are a structural deficit, uh, enrollment, which includes to some extent program catch up, enhancement of programs and information technology. Those are the components of the override. By doing the things that we've talked about in the early part of the school town partnership formula and making the change on the leases, as I mentioned, uh, what we've essentially done is we've eliminated the structural deficit um, for the schools, at least in the first year. And, uh, and so really what we're talking about is an override that would fund uh, the impacts of enrollment, some of the enhancement in, in the, in the uh, school program, and uh, a fairly robust informational technology uh, upgrade. Um, now, you could say, I suppose, that, that would, um, that's all on the schools. Um, and you know, most of it is. But we felt that it was important for, if the override failed, that there is a, a certain element that has to happen, we feel, when the, that regardless of the override, uh, we have to get the old Lincoln School up and ready to go. We need to do a number of other things. And we are, I am proposing that the town uh, share the cost of that if the override fails. And I'm going to get to that in just a moment. So uh, as, as I said, all of this, uh, the base budget growth, which we refer to as a structural deficit, has now gone away. And our override is that, that much less as a, as a result of that. So there is no school, there is no structural deficit. But there is, of course, uh, costs uh, about you know, the enrollment. So if you include without a catch up, enhancements or info technology, we've determined that that number is about $1.36 million. That's the cost of enrollment and the old Lincoln School to, no matter what happens, we, really, we feel we really have to do that. And as a result of that, we felt that, or I felt that it was important and reasonable that the town would absorb 50% of those costs, which result in about $680,000. If this board feels that that's not a good approach, you know, we would want to hear that tonight. That's a major policy decision that I think would have to go uh, forward. To do any more than that, I do think um, 
then you're starting to really um, confuse the voters, I think, or create uh, a, a notion that, you know, you're saying it's a school override, but if the override doesn't pass, then it's really, you know, the, the impacts will be more on the municipal side or, or more, um, you know, less on the school side. And I don't think that's the kind of message you want to send to the voters that, you know, we're asking you for an important override, but if it doesn't pass, well, you know, don't worry, there'll be other things cut. That's really, I think, a very important policy decision that you need to make, and we felt comfortable with that, sharing that $1.36 million amount. Um, now, the superintendent will get up shortly and talk about the impacts on the school system, and they're substantial, but um, I, would, I want to tell you um, some of the impacts that I think would result from this um, uh, sharing six hundred eighty thousand uh, dollars of the uh, from the town budget, and you'll see these charts. The one on the left represents the departments, the largest departments, and you see those. That's no surprise to you. And I think the chart on the on the right probably is no surprise. Those are the functional areas uh, when all the, all the expenses are considered, and and almost three quarters of them are personnel. So it's it doesn't really. Um, to take a genius to figure out that, you know, if we're going to have to cut, uh, it's going to be in some of those larger areas. And in fact, that's what I have done. I want to say that these are very, uh, these are very preliminary. We really have, I have not really gotten involved in the budget process quite yet. Uh, Sean and Melissa and the department heads have are been very busy at the budget, but it hasn't come to my level yet. So we haven't gone through the kind of scrutiny that we normally uh, would do when we're making recommendations like this. and so. When I show you these numbers and these, uh, these reductions, uh, I want to say that they're uh, certainly representative of what we would have to do, but they're not exactly what I, I might do. And frankly, I'm looking for some feedback, and I've told you this before, this is kind of a, a process where we give you some information, we get some policy direction, we come back with more information and so on, and this will obviously have to conclude by next month. But um, these are, what I consider to be reasonable and um, uh, recommendations and representative the kind of recommendations that I would have to make to reduce six hundred and eighty thousand dollars from the uh, the town's budget but I will say that um, open to suggestions uh, from this board and I'll also be engaging with the department heads and other stakeholders uh, in order to finalize these these numbers um, so before we move on to the superintendent, we're happy to take some questions. Yeah, I, I have a, a, this is really sort of a process question, I guess. Um, and I understand the complexity, and I know you understand the complexity, but um, we'll have to, one, put an override question on the ballot. We're hoping to do it in January. We anticipate putting a question on the ballot in January. Uh, at the same time, you and our colleagues in the school department are creating their budgets for the next fiscal year. When you publish the financial plan, do you have the intention or the thought that you will ha well, first of all, your budget has to be no override, right? Because it hasn't been passed. Yeah, but we're, we're going to do both. Okay, uh, so there'll be a zero override budget would you then include in the financial plan whatever components of override are decided to be on the ballot in other words yes. that would drive the other one or two scenarios that you would also include that's what we did yeah i know um, when you say one or two scenarios well about the i question. don't know if the if the override question will be a single question yeah. for operating it could be a tiered question right. if it's a pyramid would you create a financial plan reflecting each of those potential funding I would. amounts? I would. Revenue amounts? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Selectman Daly. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. First, um, when you mentioned um, altering the town school uh, partnership formula, I'm presuming you meant that you're deviating from the formula um, yes, the 50 -50. this year. Well, you, because uh, I, I, I really have done in the past, we have actually in the last few years uh, sh uh, gave credit for that enrollment growth. We were not planning on doing that this year. Uh -huh. 
uh, but we we would we are uh, proposing to do that again. Okay. Well, and, I just want to make sure deviation. we haven't thrown out the framework of the well, town no, school no, partnership no, no, agreement no. without a wider discussion on no. that issue. No. Okay. But then my next question. And I think we talked about it at the school town partnership meeting a couple weeks ago as well. Okay. Do that. Um, but I think the entire board, you know, if you're really trying to alter that formula on a permanent basis, I think the entire board should be, if, if not a, a financial planning committee, take a look at that before we go forward with something like that on a permanent basis. That's, that's all I want to say. Um, to, to, I want to get to some of the specific cuts you're proposing. Uh, I mean, I, again, I see the library book budget on here for $50,000. Have you talked with the library? Because they obviously had strong objections to their book budget being cut, and maybe they'd rather cut a part-time person or something like that. Um, and I'm, so I'm a little surprised to see the book budget one on here again. And I also want to, the um, mental health program, uh, that reduction seems way out of proportion compared to all the others. And can you explain that? And uh, what's going on there? Well, I, I can tell you that um, none of those um, reductions this department support. None of them. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I'm not going to be getting any um, bonus points for popularity by, by redu proposing reductions. Um, I will engage with all the departments. I, I let them know about this beforehand. I <coughs> did indicate that I felt it was representative uh, some of those are recommendations of the override study committee but that but that's still my decision and so I'm still working on it to be honest with you I'm also aware of the library's um, uh, protection under the um, certification process that they talked about last week so that could present a challenge too um, with respect to the mental health uh, it's a big cut it's a it's a program that the town has um, has uh, contracted for in the past. Uh, I think you'll hear from Dr. Balsam and others that don't support it. Um, if you can tell me some so, of the ones, I'd, I'd be well, happy Well, I mean, that, that's that, the one I want to talk about. You're okay. entirely, uh, that's not uh, paring around the edges, it looks like, from no. the numbers. <clears throat> so what exactly is it you're proposing there with that number? That, that would be eliminate to? the contractual uh, service with the uh, the, the center and and that they provide services in the schools this, this uh, is that contract um, Alan do you, maybe you could why don't you come is on this up? time for us to ask for an explanation from the actual folks who are out there let's Alan, do that let's uh, let's sidetrack here for a minute I know we have members of the uh, Brookline mental health here so no Alan and, and come on forward Ms. Price. Ms. Price, thank you. Dr. Price. Alan Balsam, Public Health and Human Services. Um, thanks for the opportunity to, to chat with you tonight. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to make a statement and then Cindy will address the specific implications of, of proposed cuts, is, if that's okay. That'd be great. So thank I've you. drafted a, a statement that I hope you have. If you don't, I have copies for you. Have you seen it? Um, if no, not, no. Um, maybe Cindy, you could just pass this to them. By the way, I, I don't envy anybody who has to come up with these cuts. Uh, this is uh, this is torture. Um, but having said that, one of the core functions of any public health department is assessment of need in the community. Toward that end, the Brookline Department of Public Health has released 16 volumes of Healthy Brookline over the past 18 years, each of which seeks to shine a light on the health status and needs of a sector of our population or on a particular set of disease conditions impacting Brookline. Several of the most recent volumes have focused on young people and older adults. For example, Healthy Brookline Volume 12, done in collaboration with the Council on Aging, examined the health status and needs of older adults over 85. Volumes 14 and 15 reported on the town's Youth Behavior Risk Survey. In addition, the Community Health Network area, Chana 18, of which Brookline is a member, conducted a health needs assessment in 2013 
and examined Brookline in addition to other communities within the group. What is striking about all of these assessments is the identification of mental health as the first or second most important health challenge among the population studied and the conclusion that Brookline needs to continue and expand mental health services here. That mental health has been the stepchild of health services is well recognized. Though parity is supposed to exist between mental and non-mental health services, this is clearly not the case. I hope that the appointment of Mary Lou Sutters, a friend and longtime advocate for mental health, as the new State Health and Human Services Chief, will signal an increased recognition of the need for adequate funding for mental health services. In the meantime, those of us who value public health and the health of our community must stand firm in opposition to cuts for mental health services in Brookline. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Price. Thank you. If you will allow, Mr. Chairman, I would like to have Peter Nordstrom, our board president, say one minute of remarks to you, sure. and then I will follow up. Thank you. Thanks. Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Nordstrand, and last September I was uh, elected president of the board of the uh, Brookline Community Mental Health Center, succeeding uh, Robin Atlas, who had served for more than eight years. Um, I'm also the treasurer of the Brookline Teen Center, and for many years served on EDAB uh, for the town. And uh, as some of you may know, my wife is also the uh, executive director of the Coolidge Corner Theater. So my family is deeply invested in, in this town. And it pains me that the first public act that I have to do is to come before this board and plead not to eliminate a mental health program that has been funded by the town for more than 50 years. Uh, and it's particularly painful because we are within a few days of the second anniversary of the Sandy Hook shootings in Newtown, Connecticut, which were perpetrated by an individual who was untreated for mental illness. And the programs that we run at the center are designed, designed to prevent that horror by, by identifying crisis situations before they get out of hand. It's, and when I look at the cuts, as, as, as the selectman has, has noted, they appear to be out of whack. We're bearing 25% of the, of the cost, and, and no other uh, town agency is being asked to take that kind of a, uh, a, a share in the, in the cutting. I know that budget cutting is not easy. It's not easy at all. But I, we do ask for fairness in this situation. And let me turn it over to Cindy to talk more about the programs. Hi, thank you for the opportunity uh, to, to appear before you. So you had asked, um, what uh, does the town contract fund? And let me uh, respond to that question. So for the $170,000 that the town contract would provide to the center, the funds go to secure access to care for Brookline residents who are in crisis or who need service at home or in the community because they can't make it to the center, or to provide consultation to town agencies and other department staff to help assure individual and community safety and well-being. Specifically, the contract supports three community social workers who provide a variety of clinical services to low and moderate income residents, services not covered by third-party health insurances. So here's some brief examples of the kinds of services that the center provides for the funding that you give them, give us. The center is called and responds when there's an emergency in the community, a sudden death of a parent of a book on student, a potentially violent situation that the police contact us to help with, a person who is about to be evicted and has no housing, a resident that a health inspector has found to be a serious hoarder and whose apartment poses a fire hazard. A seriously mentally ill adult who has stopped taking medication and poses some danger to himself, herself, or others. A child who won't attend school or has been suspended from school due to emotional illness. A neighbor who calls about a parent who's unable to care for their children. 
when there's a fire on Beacon Street. We're out there. All of these are real incidences on w in which the center is called upon daily to respond and to find resolution and to offer healing. Our community social workers meet with and offer outreach, trauma care, and other services to over 300 Brookline residents in need annually. There is no other source of funding for this type of crisis care. Perhaps there was an assumption that health insurance could be billed for this care. It cannot. Health insurance provides coverage for 50 minutes of care at a time, usually in an office setting. Most private mental health practitioners, of which there are many in Brookline, are no longer taking health insurance because the reimbursement is so poor. It covers 50 to 70 percent of the cost of care. The insurance, uh, the center bills insurance where it can, but the insurance does not cover emergency or outreach services, and no one else does. This is what the town loses when it eliminates this contract. And if it does eliminate this contract, then it is likely that overloaded town police, school, health, and social service staff will be asked to pick up the pieces as best they can, and that will be a cost to the town. Um, as far as I know, there was no discussion uh, with the center about the elimination of this funding in this contract and what it would mean for the town. There was certainly no discussion with the override committee who first proposed this cut. Uh, about what would be lost. And as far as I know, no one from the town has contacted us uh, when this cut was transferred to the elimination list. Um, I hope that this is not yet another example of stigmatization of mental health and the people who suffer from emotional illnesses. 75% of the center's clients are low and moderate income, and, it's, and that is a significant and growing population in the town. You turn on the TV, you see the impact of what happens when access to mental health care is not available. There are highly effective treatments for mental illness. It is untreated mental illness that poses a danger to our community. You may also be aware or not aware that for the $170,000 the town provides the center, the center in turn bills insurances, enters into local, state, and federal contracts and raises funds philanthropically to support the care of Brooklyn residents and to keep, keep the community safe. For every dollar provided through the contract, the center raises $35. And that's a leveraging deal that you'll be hard pressed to beat by other departments and other agencies. We want to work with you, the town administrators and others to really make sure that these services are preserved for the town. I think there are many in our town who positively value mental health services and access to that care. So I look forward to having a conversation about that. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Any questions for uh, representatives of Brookline Mental Health before we let them sit down? No, okay. I, 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 I'll just want to state, yes. let's, to keep it in context, we're talking about no override scenario and we're talking about some yes. placeholders right now of the kinds of things, and, and I don't want you to go away thinking that this is a, uh, a f uh, done deal or a foregone conclusion. We're very far from the point where that kind of cut would have to be made. So. Well, I, I appreciate I that. So. Yes, I appreciate that very much, and I appreciate the opportunity to come and, and speak um, on behalf of those services, and I sincerely look forward to working with you <coughs> to modify this list because I do think it does put the emphasis on elimination of mental health care. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a comment and, and my comment is that I am very disappointed and I'm going to be careful not to use the words I feel that there was no conversation about this uh, 50 year long relationship which is absolutely providing to our most vulnerable people. And the fact that it was put on a hit list along with cars strikes me as um, indefensible. Yeah, I have a question for Mr. Kleckner. Um, did, are you including, uh, are you assuming that even, even if an override doesn't pass, that we would do some of the um, 
revenue enhancement measures that have been discussed, like potentially raising the trash <coughs> fee or raising parking meter fees, is, is any of that included in if these? If an override does not pass. If an override does not pass, no. that we would go ahead with I some of those. I haven't uh, made that recommendation yet. Yeah. I think it's. Well, I assume we pretty desperately would well, be scrambling you know, for money. It's, it's an uh, awkward situation. You know, you, you're you posing a question to the voters, and you know, you got to be careful, I think, when you say to the voters, we want to raise your taxes, and if you don't approve that, we're going to, you know, we're just going to raise other fees as well. So I just think we need, we have to be very careful, and I I, I think Selectman Goldstein's comments are, are correct. I mean, I'm, I'm not looking to try to create any stigma or anything, but you know, the fact of the matter is if we have to cut 680, there are gonna be some difficult things. You know, we have a reduction of, of personnel on this, on this, and if it's, if it's not some of these, it's gonna be other very important things. And so, you know, if we have to cut $680,000 of the town budget, there's gonna be some pain felt, no matter what. Uh, I, I certainly will, this was- No, I, I appreciate that, but I just wanna say that, um, I, I think um, from our point of view, I, I have the greatest respect for the override study committee, but uh, on many of the specifics that things they wanted to el eliminate, I didn't agree with them when I read the report and I still don't agree with them now. And, and I think this is, I, I mean, I think there's a, couple, a number of items here and this one in particular um, where you know there would have to be some discussion with them and no you know doubt. perhaps uh, some reduction they they could handle but to sort of eliminate the whole problem program I think you're hearing from several of us is is not something we would like to see happen and I think that we're going to have to um, uh, um, look very uh, unfortunately should an override not pass I think we are going to have to look very seriously at, at anything we can do to raise revenue, but also look more broadly, perhaps, for where we eke these cuts out. So, Daly, can I, can I take from your comment, though, that you support the notion that the town is responsible for at least half of the enrollment growth in Old Lincoln School costs, though, that, 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 that $680,000 is our responsibility. Well, I, I have always, you know, been a believer that uh, the, the, the schools are part of the town. And, um, you know, many, many people, as I did many years ago, moved here uh, to Brookline um, because of the schools. And we still want the police to come and the ambulance to come and um, mental health services, et cetera. But um, uh, I, I don't think um, that... I think we would have to um, uh, tr try to work with the schools to a certain extent. So yes, the basic, I'm not opposed to the basic premise. I am opposed to some of the specifics. Good, and, and, and I agree with you on that. I, I, I accept the notion that that $680,000 is at the minimum that the town side would be expected to do in a no override situation, which I hope is not what any of us are dealing with. So, second, Franco. Uh, I, I just want to ask um, how preliminary a list this is. I, I take from your comments that this is sort of your general thinking, nothing is set in stone. We heard last week from, um, from the library that uh, a reduction of $50,000 could put as much as $134,000 in state funding at risk. I'm wondering if there's been a similar analysis um, of uh, the downstream impact on other no. funding sources that no. may come from I, these cuts. I, I want to read from my memo. <clears throat> I have identified a plan, uh, well, excuse me, the following expenditure reductions have been identified as possible recommendations for municipal reductions. Please understand that this is a very preliminary list that has been developed without the benefit of the complete budget process. And while these reductions are very representative of the types of cuts required, I respectfully reserve my right to identify alternatives. So that's, that's and, and I, I'm going to underline that this the origin of this notion was the override study committee just to be absolutely clear it was one of their recommendations I happen to disagree with it strongly but it was an override study committee recommendation Selectman Wyshynski um, I agree it's going to be painful to start identifying cuts but I think it's going to be imperative that when we identify the cuts that people perceive them as, uh, as as fair 
So if, if I were doing this, I perhaps would try to be more broad in my uh, cut list and, 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 and perhaps have a, a smaller group of cuts over a broader period and spread the pain um, and uh, not have uh, an important program like uh, the mental health program take the entire hit um, or, you know, disproportionate share of the hit. Um, so that, that would be my su suggestion. Okay. So I, I feel I have to get some of these things out to get your direction. Right, right. No. And, and we keep going from there. It yeah, is no, a very awkward it. process. It's an iterative process. This is a process that we haven't even started essentially the budget process. I mean, we started it in the early process, but it hasn't concluded uh, by any means. And so um, I, I'll need some more time, but I certainly appreciate your, uh, your input as well as that of uh, Dr. Balsam and, and, and Dr. Price and others. But I'll, I'll, I'll end by saying that uh, you know, ev every dollar the government spends has a constituency. And uh, by, spreading, by spreading the pain, uh, we're going to be hurting more constituencies. And that's why I think it's especially important that uh, we, we be perceived as fair in spreading the pain. Uh, and I just hope we don't have to uh, experience this, uh, that we can put together a package that will win the support of the voters. And that's the important thing here. But, but certainly, I think that, that um, we would be considering revenue enhancement measures um, at the same time we were looking at cuts. So to, to try to... Um, that, that would be my To assumption. try to reduce some of these numbers. Right. Just to state the obvious, and this is something that was included in the override study committee report, I think the, the strong reaction that you've heard from this board tonight at some of these potential, and I underscore, underscore the word potential cuts, um, demonstrates that there is not a lot of fat in the budget. There is no fat in the budget. And everything that we are looking at is valuable and this town is run efficiently. Okay. So uh, we interrupted you at one point, Mr. Kleckner, but I think you might have been at the I end. I think I was going to anyway. quickly turn it over to the superintendent. <laughs> 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 well, maybe well, maybe that's what you'd like to do right now. <laughs> okay. So with that, I'll, I will do that. Thank you. Thank you, I think, Mr. Kluckner. <laughs> well done. Um, so uh, thanks for having us back. Uh, a couple things. Um, I, I want to start out by um, expressing my appreciation to uh, Mr. Kluckner, Mr. Cronin, for the uh, continued work that we do together around the town school um, partnership. Um, and I want to take you through some pieces of the, of the, uh, of the rest of the story here. Um, so this is where we started, um, where Mr. Kleckner started, um, and, and I want to say a word about a couple of these areas that, that he talked about that are, that are not part of enrollment. So, so right, enrollment is, part, enrollment is part of the calculation of the town school partnership. Um, but um, historically, that is a very limited definition of the term. The definition of enrollment in the town school partnership is teacher in a classroom. We expand by X number of sections, five, let's say. It's five teachers split between the town and schools. It does not, as that, as that enrollment continues to grow, it does not take into account in a large school the literacy specialists, the math specialists, the nurses, the guidance counselors, the social workers, the assistant principals that come with running that school. So it's an exceptionally narrow but well appreciated definition of the term. Most of what I just talked about is included in that catch-up line around guidance counselors and those other areas. Okay? So um, 
So let me stick with this basic premise here to, to start that when we break out those areas and take a look at those areas over the three years, catch up again, including those number of those areas I talked about, enhancements being, enha being work that we're doing in particular initiatives like the Literacy Project, um, information technology being that technology plan. And again, the elements in those first areas, in particular the first one, program catch up, are all enrollment growth associated. And in fact, most of those in enhancement are enrollment growth associated. They just don't meet the conditions of that very narrow definition of enrollment. So um, Mr. Kleckner started out here by saying, you know, if you, if you factor in an enrollment component, if you factor in the opening the old Lincoln School, you're at about a $1.3 million shortfall. So what we did here was we took the three years of program catch-up enhancement and information technology, and, and this is where maybe we, we part a little bit in, in terms of our analysis of this. We, there are some of those things that we need to do in a no override scenario. And we'll need to consider as we discuss the budget with the school committee and need to make, make recommendations on as we consider the no override scenario budget. We, so just for, just for discussion tonight, we took those and modified them. No scientific approach here at all to the numbers that you see uh, to, the, to the left there. The program catch up about 1.1 million enhancement of points of, of $700,000 and information technology of about $550,000. That's another 2.4. And that quickly turns the $600,000 shortfall that Mr. Kleckner talked about in our budget to a $3 million shortfall. Now, obviously, that's, that's, that's not where we would end up in a no override scenario. But, but it's to illustrate that there is some point. And I can't tell you, because we haven't discussed it in any in any length, at any length with the school committee yet, what that number is. I mean, is it merely taking the, um, the, the uh, um, catch up numbers and, and factoring some portion of those in? So what, what is it at the end of the, what does the $680,000 become when we actually look at the budget for that FY16 no override? Is it a $2.4 million shortfall, 1.2, or is it around the $680,000? I can tell you it's more than that. So that would mean additional reductions then to the base budget. And, and again, as far as we're able to go with this tonight is where we were the last time, right? Because we haven't even started this budget process yet, this particular budget process. So again, what I'll lay out for, just for example purposes, is just what some programs cost. Right? I'm not saying they would be on the list. I'm not saying they're at the top of some list. I am saying that a number of them were in the 65% scenario that we showed you some number of weeks ago. But if you factor down, let's, let's, let's take the scenario that says 1.2. So what that means is the $680,000, the, the, the piece that Mr. Kleckner walked you through, and adding, let's say, $600,000 from the catch-up list. Now we're at 1.2, 1.3. So we now have 1.3 to reduce if that's, what, if that's what the no override budget is going to look like. These are the areas, and, and because, because now I'm not cutting things from enhancement, that's gone. Didn't happen. I'm not cutting from technology because it didn't happen. So now I'm to core, service, core services, I'm to core programs. I'm looking at high school staffing and potentially the four plus one, the tutorial program. I'm looking at things like the elementary world language program. I'm looking at areas like steps to success. I'm looking at areas like our enrichment and challenge support. And, and, and we can make a list. And we'll need to, obviously, to create this particular scenario for approval as one of our budgets for the school committee to consider when they see the superintendent's message in early February. So just to you, give you, you would have heard my question to Mr. Kleckner, so I guess my question to you is equally, when you propose your uh, superintendent's recommended budget, are you proposing to lay out the no override, the other yes. possible? Yes. Okay. We'll do, we'll, we'll do at, least, at least a budget around a no override scenario and whatever question or questions you I, I'm assuming whatever goes on the ballot would be the basis for alternatives. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So whether that's 
you know, one question that leads us to do at least two right. budgets? Is it is it some kind of tiered pyramid question that may lead to three or more budgets that we would have to okay. put out for people to look at? Okay. Well, I'm sorry. I'm done. <laughs> Superintendent Lupini, are you finished? I, I am. Okay. Happy to take any questions. Slag yeah, um, it, it, it seems to be that what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, what are we going to need to help us make a decision on the structure of the ballot questions? And in my mind, I'm thinking at the very least a chart which has things like these programs um, as a row, and then in your columns you have no override, uh, we've been talking a 65% number, a 90% number, and anything else you might want to propose to us. And from there, we and the voters can see on a page ha the, the, the progression of how you know, w w what are they buying yep. by voting for these different scenarios? And that'll help us make a decision. Uh, and, I, and I would think it would also help the school committee make a decision on, because uh, what, 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 so, what you're, yeah. So it's in process. That, okay. Exactly what you talked about is in process. I mean, I guess I would throw out that the one sort of disclaimer is that, that, that it's not our budget, right? Our, it, it doesn't represent what the school committee has approved as right. the budget, it merely represents where we are now and, and, and right. the and kinds of things. Same issue on well, the right, exactly we, you do. We, we did, sorry, put Mr. Kleckner on the spot on this one too, in the same way, I mean. Yes. So, so yes, in as, as much as we can, right. that one right. can. And, and then, you know, recognizing that there's still more process uh, that's going to occur afterwards, but, you know, we have, we have to have right. some basis to right. uh, make some Absolutely. decisions. Absolutely, yes. And that, as I said, that's in, that's in process for, for all of you and for the school committee. Right. Good. Are, are we going to see a, um, a chart that shows what no override does to class sizes, for example? So, um, in as much as um, So, there, so the, the, the struggle with the question is there are some assumptions in, in the question about, uh, in answering it, about what steps might be taken with respect to um, policies that would influence that. I mean, I mean, short of that, what you would see is a, is a change in the ranges. You'd see spiking. In other words, because the, 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 the only way, um, the main way, let me see, not the only way, the, only, the, ma the main avenue we have for impacting class size now is a consolidation, right? right. Is a consolida and a consolidation, whether it's in kindergarten as kids enter and we say, well, we're only going to run this many sections, not the 31 that we're running now or whether it occurs in a fourth grade that currently exists and we say, well, it looks like the number is low enough that we can run three sections instead of four. Many of those cases, if you look at our present enrollments, are where you see some 26s or 25s because we've done a consolidation there and we've driven that number up to the, to the 20. So you would see, you, you would, you would see your, your, your range would broaden. Um, you would still see class sizes, I think, in any circumstance, um, at, the num at some of the numbers that we have now, and you would see some that would be larger. Um, but, um, uh, but as I've said for some number of years now, the, the only way to impact that um, further, um, given particularly the steps that we've already taken with respect to delaying assignments, all those things I went through with you a number of weeks ago, the, the steps that we've taken to make sure we're assigning as efficiently as possible, right? Delaying till later and, and all those kinds of things would be to be able to widen buffer zones or assign outside of attendance areas. Um, and, and, and I don't anticipate that happening. So my question was, for example, class sizes, and that's what I've, you know, outside the example of class sizes, it would be 
policy decisions? Are, are we going to see a breakdown that's not just a matter of FTEs, but a, a breakdown that says what are some of the policy changes that would be forced upon you with no override? Um, so, so we can certain we can certainly give you uh, areas where there are policies. Goodness knows there have been enough discussion of them the last two years. We could certainly give you areas where there are policies that, if certain decisions were made relative to those to those areas, they they could have impact. It's for others. The school starting with the school committee because they're there, it's their policy book. I mean, um, to, 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 to determine we're, we're down to the uncomfortable conversation understood you heard mr kleckner a minute understood. ago you know having to say something very difficult about brookline mental health i think we're at the point in this conversation on the school side too where we, so, where so, we have to talk about so those I, I would, subjects respectfully i would say that these are difficult conversations right we've been through some of these before <laughs> Come to those public hearings. Those are difficult conversations, mm -hmm. right? Every one of those programs has a constituency. Some of them were created it's nothing through easy overrides, right? So, 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 yeah, those. some of those okay. exist already, but some of them, you know, I mean, there are there are policy decisions about um, student assignment, about students who who attend here, those kinds of things that that I'm sure in that kind of situation um, we'll have to discuss with the school committee. And yes, we can identify what they are. Thank you. Second daily. Yeah. Um, well, I have two things. One, I, I am. Uh, I want to offer my opinion. Uh, the, I, I'm distressed to see the steps to success program on there, and that looks to me like the total elimination of the program. That again, I'm, I'm going to say what Mr. Collector said earlier. Right. Yeah. These are up here to give you, and this is what we do when we discuss them with the school committee. That's to give you the total cost of the program. That's not a recommendation. Okay. Right. Well, These I mean, examples, I just... examples, so that you, so that you can put a cost, right, around a comparison to a total cut that would be necessary. School committee members find it helpful to look at what it costs to run Program X compared to the total amount that they're being cut, they're being asked to cut. Right? And that's that's all we're trying to illustrate tonight. Those aren't recommendations. Those aren't even our options. They're merely comparison points. Okay. All right. Because um, I, I do think that program, I mean, I think we heard last week something about, um, the, the, you know, there's long been that achievement gap between the children of color and, and Yeah, you heard that. And not, yes, I said And that. you were saying that that had... <laughs> been shrinking for a while and then wasn't really shrinking lately. And I, I think Steps to Success is a, a I, I key agree. portion in addressing that. So I would, I would hate to see that one take the whole, the whole brunt of it. But my, my question to you is, because uh, I'm a little perplexed by these numbers, and you're talking about an additional re reduction in 600,000. So is that like assuming that this board didn't go along with giving uh, you more than you might be strictly entitled to under the uh, town school partnership? Is that where you're getting that $600,000 number? Or what is that no, number no, from? No, no. So what I'm saying is, and, and, and um, said stated earlier, that, that in, in the scenario that Mr. Kleckner laid out, um, the school department gets at least 50% of the $1.3 million shortfall from the town in, in what he laid out earlier. What I'm suggesting is that that formula takes only the traditional elements of the town school partnership, which includes a, a very narrow definition of enrollment into account. Okay? So we start out this discussion, as does the town, with a $680,000 shortfall. Okay? What I'm suggesting is even if you look at pieces of the catch-up number, which I would argue is enrollment, but has not traditionally been part of the definition, right? Mm -hmm. but, but clearly we would agree that guidance counselors and nurses and vice principals and literacy specialists and math specialists are increased by enrollment. We would, I think we would all agree to that. They're in that catch-up number, okay? So there's some number at the, at the very least in there. Even if I set technology, and enhancement aside, there's some number in that catch-up number that we might add. And what I said is, let's just suggest so that we can have a discussion adding $600,000. Okay. 
to it. Okay. Now the shortfall is not is not six hundred and eighty thousand dollars, it's one point two to one point three. So there's some number that we start out with that we haven't yet determined because we haven't gone deep enough into that to say, look, what, what is it that we need to do in that catch-up number no matter what? No matter what happens here. Because as I've said to you every time I've stood here over the last few months, right, we, we've delayed a number of those catch-up areas long enough. We, 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 we can't sustain them in schools of seven, eight, nine hundred students with some of the guidance staffing, the nursing staffing, the literacy staffing, the math staffing that we have now. So there's some steps we'd have to take in at least that area. That's okay. what I'm saying. Okay. I hope that helps. All right. I think it's also important to, to remember that the, the bulk of an, the technology plan and, and program enhancements would not happen in a, if this override didn't pass. And what Bill's talking about is what are the, what are the very key parts of those that we'd have to do, whether right. it's 600 or whatever, but I don't want to lose the the uh, thought that technology plan and enhancement program enhancement in schools would not occur if this override did not pass. I, I have an opinion uh, similar to Selectman Daly's, and I guess I'm going to say what I see on this list is um, program cuts, but I also see Steps to Success as being the only one on that list that singles out low income and minorities for uh, reduction. And frankly, I think you could do with fewer uh, generic support staff that you do not currently have before you would cut a program like that. And I hope you would be willing to say that too. <clears throat> I'll try again. I've given you examples of program costs. And there I, I are probably should have given you 10 more. <laughs> right? Probably should have. Right. Probably okay, should have, fair. because this one singles out very calculatedly, it seems to me, I would, I, in I, ways I, that are not very, let's put it this way, defensible from my perspective. So I'm sorry you feel that way. That's, that's not okay. why That's okay. That's my opinion. So you heard Selakman Wyshynski uh, ask for a chart that spells out some yes. more program costs. And um, you said that that information was being developed, it was forthcoming. Can you give us a sense of when we might receive it? Is it going to be in early January? Is it close to completion uh, so we could have it next week? Before the break? Yeah. Before the break. Okay. Okay. Anything further? Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for everyone listening. We're going to move on to our next agenda item, which is license renewals. Whoops. Uh, if anybody's leaving the room, will they do so expediously so that we could uh, continue? I'm going to turn this portion of the meeting over to Selectman Daly uh, in as much as I need to recuse myself on some of the, the licenses, and it's a lot easier for me to do it if I'm not actually running the meeting at that moment. So, okay. Selectman Daly. Okay. Th um, well, we have a number of, I, I will note that we did get a memo um, that uh, Clear Flower Bakery has not been applying for a food vendor license and probably... Excuse me, folks, if you, if you could keep it down so we can hear each other. Yeah. Thank you. So, speaking as one of their frequent customers, I know they do so a lot to the public. So um, I assume, Mr. Kleckner, that uh, Pat Maloney is recommending that they be um, sort of notified of this. I assume somebody's doing that? Yes, and we're going to get the, an application from them and uh, bring it to you next week. Okay, great. So let's go on to coin-operated amusement devices. Um, they, the, um, we have several, uh, Brookline Lodge of Elks and Coolidge Corner Clubhouse, and the police and fire departments have inspected all locations, listed, and recommend renewal for 2015. So does anybody have any questions or want to discuss any of these locations? No. I'm going to move favorable action then on the coin oper uh, the renewing the licenses for 2015 on the coin operated uh, amusement licenses as listed and on this sheet. All in favor? Um, 
Selectman DeWitt? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Aye. Selectman Franco? Aye. And I'll vote aye. This is hard getting this. This is weird. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what you're supposed to do either. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, All right. I'll even mention I didn't give her advance warning. <laughs> yeah. to, to okay. Uh, so let's move on to the common victualler, and uh, we'll probably have a few more questions on these. Um, can, can, can I state before we begin that I'm going to recuse myself in the following matters? In fact, I will recuse myself for CV license, entertainment, and to the extent applicable liquor license for 1632 Beacon Street Cafe Nicholas, 1648 Beacon Street Public House, 14 Green Street Osaka, 278 Harvard Street Paris Creperie, 387 Washington Street Village Fair Pizza, and 714 Washington Street, Washington Square Tavern, due to a business relationship. Okay, did you get that, Kate? Okay. Um, I'm not going to read through all the common victualler. Um, that we have a, an extensive list of it, uh, 38 pages of them. Um, the police and building and fire departments have inspected all locations listed and recommend renewal for 2015. Um, the health department recommends approval of all food vendor license renewals for 2015, subject to final inspection um, and in complete, including compliance with our polystyrene and plastic bag ban, which went into effect uh, December 1st, 2014. Um, the following common victuallers have been approved for renewal but have not filed the appropriate renewal paperwork. 1632 Beacon Street. Isn't that one of the ones you just listed, Slacken? Uh, yeah, yes. Goldstein. You did. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, four Brookline Place. No, well, this is 1026 Commonwealth <laughs> Avenue. This, uh, the first one was Cafe Nicholas. The second is New England Soup Factory. Uh, the third was Quan's Kitchen. And the last is 75 Harvard Street, the Brookline Spa. Well, I hope um, they will get their renewals. Well, and, and yeah. then there's another list, uh, Slegman Daly, you may get to it eventually, but under the um, fire inspections, they actually list two more, I think, that are closed that were not on... That's number six of this memo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, right. Number, number five also. Yeah. And I actually, I think I'll so. add to my recusals <laughs> that yeah. to the extent we're not um, uh, moving for a common victualler's license or a renewal of, um, of liquor license for 1032 Beacon Street Mission Cantina. I think it's Cantina. Cantina. Cantina? Uh, yeah. I recuse myself from that matter as well due to a business relationship. Okay. Um, well, the, the ones I just read off, it's recommended that these licenses be approved subject to the filing of the appropriate paperwork and right. fees, including a $50 late fee. Okay, and I just wanted to be sure that we had all of the, the, the total list is all of the same named entities. Okay. Which I found a little bit confusing. That's well, my issue. Well, the following common victuallers are closed for business, have not filed for renewal. That's Mission Cantina, 1032 Beacon Street, uh, the Metropolitan Club, 1204 Boylston Street mm -hmm. and Zen at 320 Washington Street. But the chief fire chief says Olea Cafe is also closed. Yeah, well, the, the, the next one says the following common victuallers are closed at this time but have filed for renewal. Um, and that, oh. that, that's where I think we have the questions maybe. Olea Cafe. Oh, Olea, I see. Transferring in January. Okay, yeah. all right, fine. Um, and the other one's under. Okay. So you may remember we transferred that license once yeah, already, and then it, yeah. yet it fell apart. Two hundred two. Have they filed? And two hundred two Washington, Washington Street. Washington. Yes. So they're not open yet. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I thought we actually voted to transfer it. We did, did, and then they, they, then they withdrew that. They, 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 they withdrew, withdrew, withdrew um, if I recall. Well, yeah. I do think Selectman DeWitt has a point. If they didn't find someone to transfer to and they're holding an alcoholic beverage license and not using it, I mean, I, don't, I think don't that's a legitimate question. I mean, we've had this issue before. In order for you not to renew it, you'd have to hold a hearing and... Yeah. Um, you know, we can do that if you'd That's like. Right. And it can have... Or you, I think sometimes you maybe have given a um, sort of a partial or, you know, a, just a short a sh license. A short renewal? Um, yeah, like... Well, I'm, I'm willing to give it to them through January hmm. and see if they can... Either way, you have to have a hearing if you... Right, and, to, and uh, uh, I, I actually have another matter which I was going to bring up under um, alcoholic beverages, but I will say now, and that is um, there are a number of things that we have discussed over several years that would require a public hearing and we never scheduled the public hearing. So maybe we should think as a group about holding a public hearing to address some of these unresolved issues. One of them is that um, there were a number of violations. Um, I don't need to describe when or where exactly. Uh, and at that time, we said that that particular uh, entity should not be allowed to operate until 2 a.m. seven nights a week. But that license continues to be until 2 a.m. seven nights a week because we never scheduled a public hearing to review it. And there are other ones that are sort of out there that never got addressed like that. And it just seems to me maybe we want to think about how we can tie these loose ends up. Well. Do you get, have some names for us before we renew these for the year? Well, well you, you, right. you've got to do it. You can't not do it without a public hearing. That's the problem. That's how we got hung up before. And I, I have a file from last year, and it just got, okay. you know, and that's, slipped away. And that's uh -huh. the point I want to make on, on Olea Cafe yeah. and Olea. It, it, you know, to, to the extent that they're closed and they don't reopen and we want to, to rescind their license, that's a matter for another night for the right we can't do it now for the I, I, I'm admitting we cannot do it now but I do think, I think what we, Mr. Kleckner is telling us we can give them a shorter than a year I wouldn't recommend it no? okay well I don't know about how how we want to go ahead but I do believe that it would be thoughtful and maybe the licensing committee can take this up when we've finished dealing with some of our other pressing matters but um, try to figure out which of these things need to be addressed, including the expiring licenses that didn't get renewed. And I'm less concerned about common victualler than I am about Liquor. alcoholic beverage. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, I'm going back to item four now. The Economic Development Office received a complaint yeah. regarding the common victualler liquor license held by Citroen Garden, 295 Washington Street. And the complaint was to the effect that they have, uh, for some extended period of time, and advertising prices on their uh, website that were um, a dollar below what they actually charged. And so when you got there to pick up your food, you actually got charged the current prices, I believe. Um, so and that actually made me wonder, and I'm not proposing to do this, uh, whether it would be appropriate in the same way that we do stings, that we do some sort of random yeah. checking. Let me, I see Mr. Maloney is there, and maybe you can come up to the microphone and tell us. Uh, were you aware of that um, complaint? And I was just made aware of that issue this evening. Uh, okay. Somebody forwarded the um, Boston.com uh, tread of the, uh, the uh, situation. Uh, this particular issue would come under the health department. Uh, we would have our sealer of weights and measures investigate this because it's a consumer protection issue. So what I will do is make sure it's logged in and have our sealer investigate this. But it is correct. If, uh, whether it's online, uh, posted on the menu, there should be accuracy uh, for the customer. So they do pay what they're expected and not charge the It's price. sort of a strange but not totally unrelated thing that, that's, I don't know how we're ever going to deal with because it's out there in the ether or the cloud. Um, there are, uh, I believe Olea still has a website up. There are places that are, you can look up um, in a list of restaurants uh, provided by third parties 
that indicate places that are, op that are no longer operating as if they're still in existence. I don't know how we deal with that. It's just another. I don't think yeah. and, so. and, and there are these third party yeah. menu. Yeah. Or that's what I mean. Services Things like that. They have old menus. Yeah. So this is. And they have old menus that are out of date yeah, with wrong prices. This is an technology yeah. that, you know, when we talk about consumer protection, and I think this particular issue will cause others to, to think, you know, and visit their web page because yeah. the fines are triple, uh, triple damages, and 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 um, so so it is something. So we'll it, look is into. it your recommendation, Mr. Maloney, that we renew the common victualler license and the liquor license of Sichuan Garden, and I'll leave it to you to bring it back to us if there needs to be a hearing? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. We uh, this you know we have co sporadic complaints throughout the year, and this would be something that I wouldn't feel rises to the threshold of um, holding their annual license. But we'll investigate, and if we find there's uh, a blatant issue, we'll bring it to the board's attention cool. for okay. addressing. Yes, Selectman Wyszynski. Ah, okay, you're chairing, I was yes. waving it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's come back to that third party menu page. So uh, this third party was no relationship with, or, with the uh, with the restaurant has incorrect prices. How, how can you hold that third party liable? Or the, well, the restaurant liable for the third party, yeah, or right. the third party restaurant for the liable? I don't know the answer. I, I think we'd have to drill down and see what that relationship is. We've had over the years complaints, and minimal, but a complaint or two regarding some of these delivery services. Okay. And when we drilled down, we found out, well, there was a, a relationship because they don't just walk in and right. say, I'm going to deliver your food. They do establish something. So as such, I think some education right. to the operator when you enter these third party um, situations, be advised, you know, it can reflect yeah. on so your license. That's a delivery service. But then there are also these menu page uh, sites that just post menus. And then there's no relationship. So, I, yeah. I don't. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, Pat. <laughs> give favorable action on renewing the common victualler licenses that are in this uh, extensive sheet that we have, Kate. With the exception that those listed under item three will um, only be uh, approved subject to the filing of the appropriate paperwork and fees, including the fifty-dollar late fee and that those um, listed under item five are not included? Is that, is that acceptable? Well, five, five they never apply. They never okay. So we don't recommend. They're not uh, on the list. We do not recommend renewing those. But I don't think they're on the renewal list, okay. are they? They're, well, look, they're not. I look for okay. them. No. They're not in these materials. Yeah, okay, right. If they're not on the list, I, I, didn't, I didn't. I confess I didn't look <laughs> them up individually. Um, <laughs> So I'll amend my motion to take out any mention of those in item five. All right, all in favor, Selectman DeWitt. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Subject to recusal, aye. <laughs> Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. And I'll vote aye. Okay, uh, now we can go to the entertainment licenses, weekly and Sunday. Um, now, I'm so, just going to reiterate that some of these also have hours that if we had considered reviewing as the same hours apply to common Vic, alcoholic beverage, and entertainment. So if we ever decide to address that question, entertainment would be, for those particular establishments, be part of it. Well, I assume we have to vote all this by the end of the year. Do you want to hold any of these until next I, week? It doesn't make any sense. I think it would be far better for us okay. to come up with a list of affected establishments and then okay. do public notice and say, you know, we're trying to clean things up or, you know, whatever. Okay. Well, most of these establishments are, are having radio music or taped music or TV. A few have live entertainment. Um, I won't read the whole list because it's... Uh, it's not quite, it's, it's, it's only uh, 17, it's pages. 17 many, pages. Many pages. <laughs> many pages. Um, the police building and health department under uh, the uh, common victualler and food vendor inspections also uh, are recommending, looked at these places and also recommending the um, entertainment licenses for 2015. 
So I'll move favorable Can, action on there. And so I have question. a question before we get yes. to the vote. Uh, I'm looking at the last page of this packet and uh, the title Sunday Entertainment Licenses. Uh, is it? I'm a little confused as to why these were singled out. I think it's a requirement it's a that they have a separate license. Because probably the hours have to be different under state law. Am I, are we right about that? It, it requires today? a separate approval, a separate, a separate approval license for Sundays. So it's I'm not clear that, that they actually take advantage of this, all of them. It's that they apply for it in case. So I I'm think. looking at some of these uh, establishments that are listed elsewhere in the packet, particularly page 13 is an example. There are um, businesses here that have Sunday through Saturday hours listed. So. Right, that's part of what I was trying to say. We have these inconsistencies that we should fix, okay. and the only way we can do it is with a public hearing. Okay. And I'm sorry I didn't anticipate it because I thought of it last year and we didn't do it last oh. year. I mean, I didn't realize it. I'm sorry. At renewal time, I learned about this, and we've now spent what, what 11 months and we didn't your, do it. Uh, question, though, uh, I want to be clear. So the, there's one, two, three, four, five, six establishments listed yes. on this last page. Yeah, for Sunday. And then on page 13, um, there are two establishments, um, the bottom two on the page, that have hours listed Sunday through Saturday. I'm wondering why those businesses probably. aren't also listed on the Sunday entertainment license uh, list. Good question. Well, they have well, a five for Sunday. It, yeah, but I think that the ones on the back are live entertainment, and the ones well, on page 13 are... Except for, for the... You know, I, I actually the believe these may... I, I, okay. I think these uh, ones that are Sunday entertainment licenses are probably very ancient in origin, and yeah. that's part of what I was trying to say. There yeah. are a number of either changes in statute or practice that we just never reconciled and, one and only recently did we get a database that allowed us to see them as clearly as we can now one on page oh, i have something to add actually sorry to interrupt oh, yes but just from the means. application itself it's the form of entertainment that makes them separate from the regular sunday entertainment so dancing jukebox and live entertainment requires a separate approval process oh but thank you TV melissa yeah. uh, uh, um, I, I do notice though on page 13 a layer is on there um with uh, so some of them are fairly new <laughs> uh radio tv and tape music so they must be listening to that while they renovate uh, <laughs> mother yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah so I, I thank you melissa so i think that's the that's, that's the distinction the, explanation. the form of entertainment why the list is okay i'm going to move with favorable <laughs> action then on the entertainment license re license renewals for 2015 all in favor selectman dewitt aye selectman goldstein subject to my previously stated recusions <laughs> aye selectman washinsky aye selectman franco aye and i'll vote <coughs> aye. okay uh next one is food vendor and this is i mentioned at the beginning mr maloney's memo concerning um the Clear Flower Bakery, so they're obviously not in here, and they need to apply. <coughs> um, police, building, and fire have inspected all locations listed and recommended approve renewal for 2015. Um, the health department recommends approval um, for 2015, subject to final inspection, including complete compliance with polystyrene and plastic bag ban. Uh, the following food vendor is closed for business and has not filed for renewal, C2U Sushi at 5 Kendall Street. And the following food vendor has been approved for renewal but has not filed appropriate renewal paperwork, 6 Cypress Street, Olacito. It's recommended that this license be approved subject to the filing of the appropriate paperwork and fees, including a $50 late fee. Um, again, I'm not going to read through the whole list of names. Any... Um, Concerns or questions? None. Great. Uh, I'm going to recommend then favorable action, um, with the exception of CTU Sushi, if it happens to be in there, and uh, that Olacito at 6 Cypress Street would be subject to filing the appropriate paperwork and the $50 late fee. Um, all in favor? Selectman DeWitt? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Aye. Selectman Franco? Aye. And I'll vote aye. Okay, we're on to um, inholder. Uh, 
<clears throat> okay, the police, building, fire, and health departments have inspected all locations and recommend renewal for 2015 of the ones that are included on this list. And I, I believe, Mr. Maloney, that our list has been shrinking of inns and lodging houses, et cetera. Oh, uh, that lodging, lodging houses lodging are separate. Lodging separate. houses are separate. Okay. Yeah, the lodgings are separate from the inns. The inns are the Holiday Inn. And the Brookline Courtyard. Correct. Is courtyard, right? Marriott. So right? it's just those two. Okay, in, the, in this case, one. I will Someday read them. <laughs> we, we hope this list is going to expand in the next couple of yes. years. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the Holiday Inn on Beacon Street and the Brookline Courtyard by Marriott uh, on Webster Street are the two that are listed. Um, any concerns, None. members of the board? Nope. I'll move favorable action, though, then on those um, license renewals for 2015. A lot of these memos, Kate, say 2014, but they should say 2015. Mm. So make sure that the minutes are correct on that. Um, all in favor, Selectman DeWitt. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. And I'll vote aye. Okay. Uh, liquor. Can I state my recusals <laughs> on liquor? I recuse myself from consideration of 1648 Beacon Street, Public House, 14 Green Street, Osaka, Japanese, 714 Washington Street, Washington Square Tavern. Uh, the liquor wine malt license at 227A Cypress Street, Kirkman's Market, and to the extent that we're not renewing 1032 Beacon Street Mission Canteen, I also recuse myself due to a business relationship. Okay. All right. Building and fire departments have inspected all locations listed and recommend renewal for 2015. Uh, the police department has inspected all locations and recommends approval. Um, and... We actually have three that I, I believe we will want to be sure and perhaps you explicitly state not renew. <laughs> yes. Well, we're not voting not to renew, but they did not submit. Okay, three. but I, I, I think at least I yes. would identify, because we're saying all yes. of the items on our list, please name those three as being right. exceptions. Okay, and the health department recommends approval of law local license renewals. Um, subject to final inspection, including compliance with the polystyrene and plastic bag ban. Um, the following license holders, liquor license holders, are closed and did not renew their licenses. The Metropolitan Club at 1204 Boylston Street, Jimmy's at 1653 Beacon Street, and Mission Cantina at 1032 Beacon Street. So um, I, if those happen to be on the list still in any way, I will exclude them from my motion. The following liquor license holder is closed but renewed their license for 2015, and this is Olea Cafe, as we previously discussed, at 195 Washington Street, so we will include that, um, and uh, we'll call them in for a hearing if they don't um, reopen. reopen. Okay. Right. I'll note that um, in the fire department's memo, they were not able to inspect a lair, so we should make because it was closed because yeah. it's under renovation. Yeah, okay. So the I, I would feel comfortable yeah. license, issuing that license condition on final inspection by the right. fire department. Okay, so I'll make a motion for favorable action, um, ex exempting the three I listed. Okay, I have a question. Uh, I'm sorry. Right. Um, there is one about which I have mixed feelings, and that's the package store, GPS, mm -hmm. which was um, given uh, an ABC citation and actually has been suspended, uh, will be suspended for 20 days in January 2015. Uh, there were some significant repeat violations of sales to minors. Um, I don't know. We don't seem to have anybody here from public safety, so we can't really ask a question about it. But boy, would I ever want them to be on a monitored, monitoring list of some sort. Um, they, they do. Uh, um, off, Lieutenant Hayes does address that in his memo. Yeah, I know. Um, and it's probably a legal question because, you know, since the ABCC does have um, jurisdiction and they've had, they have done a sanction, can we do something more than that? I'm not asking to do more. I guess what I want to do is keep them under close <coughs> observation. That's, that's, that's my comment. 
And that's what uh, Derek Hayes uh, yeah. recommends as yeah. well. Yeah, I I'm, I'm basically want, I don't know how to do this, and maybe we don't do it in our vote, but in the public record, Kate, yep. I would like it to be noted that ABCC has cited licensee GPS Wine and Spirits and for multiple violations of sales to minors and have suspended their license for 20 days and I want us to pay close attention to this um, establishment uh, over the next licensing period. That's all. Okay. So, uh, I agree with that. yes, okay. So I am um, moving favorable action then, exempting the three uh, uh, that did not apply um, for, to renew their licenses. We will include Alea Cafe, and we will include Alea, but that is subject to the um, inspection by the fire department. Okay. And uh, the language Selectman DeWitt wishes <laughs> put in the record. We'll include that. Okay. All in favor? Selectman DeWitt? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Subject to previously stated recusions, aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Aye. Selectman Franco? Aye. And I'll vote aye. Okay, now we're up to the lodging houses. This is what's happening with the lodging houses, Mr. Maloney. Uh, we, we had some lodging facilities that had to cancel their annual inspections and delayed it. So as a result, it delays our opportunity to give the board a favorable recommendation. So we've had a handful of those. Um, surprisingly, we have uh, two facilities that have not responded to contact from our inspectional service, uh, nor... Is that 91 Babcock and 57 Dwight? Correct. correct. And, and they, your, your assumption is that they're not operating anymore? That's correct. The, the buildings, uh, uh, when our inspectors did arrive, we sent them a notice and we showed up. The, the inspectional team was there and there was no one there to, to greet us and it appeared that the places were not occupied. Hmm. Not so, occupied by anybody? Correct. Huh. I'm just wondering because that's there's kind of a you know a niche of people without much money uh, for whom the lodging houses have yeah the, been these sort facilities of traditionally were used under a um, uh, uh, like a therapeutic program where there was counseling and services going on uh, uh, and and I'm not sure uh, what again no communication no they responds. were those two related they were both related so yeah. they're not the traditional where oh. somebody would okay. sign in yeah. but uh, it's still uh, it's you know concerning to us because the lodging facilities there's a potential two properties that could be uh, affordable housing you know, it's, mm. right I was Intel wondering reference. perhaps if any if any of these groups of licenses would be held over for subsequent vote maybe maybe these would I see there's a number of of uh, issues that that might get clarified within the next week or two you just want to hold all of the I, lodging I'm, house because I, I actually have a well, question just, about 89 89 Marion Street which seems to me has a history of difficulties and they haven't gone away but it's in the memo from uh, Lieutenant Simmons and I it's sort of a different question about 400 Heath Street uh, which is Pine Manor College, you for the record. direct any of these questions to Well, I don't know that it's really... Here? I mean, Pat knows 89 Marion, for sure, yeah. very well. Yeah, 89... In person. <laughs> 89 Marion Street um, has had code enforcement issues, and we've requested police uh, assistance on some of our inspections. So, as a result, I think you're seeing the recommendation from the police for whatever issues... Uh, have arisen there. Well, but what he's what he's saying is that they've had a, a an increased number of calls, um, and that they have um, said they will continue to monitor. And I just guess I was wondering if you had any insight into whether things had deteriorated significantly, or they they were deteriorating this year. What uh, did occur is we. <coughs> And I believe the board, um, a, a name was presented for a new agent. And so for the past right. five months, we've had a new agent there. And we've seen a turnaround. Oh, good. Okay. Um, well, however, that's, that's 
we'll, we'll still monitor but sure. that's what was needed I think the the agent just disappeared and as a result uh, this facility wasn't monitored adequately Got it. and um, but as you can see we uh, did not hold it up for code enforcement right. so uh, I think they're going in the, in the right direction but we'll keep a, a close eye on it I, I noticed too in here I mean uh, Mr. Kleckner's correct there seem to be a lot of uh, things going on here um, there's a number the, the fire memo they believe 91 Babcock and 57 Dwight were sold they mm -hmm. note that in their memo and they say 143 St. Paul is under construction not occupied but there's a whole long list that haven't had their annual inspections I don't know if and, what's going on there but yeah that was you know we, we arrange we attempt to arrange these starting in September and uh, some operators say they're not ready for us they delay the inspection do and you, I, th this is from the fire department though do you guys inspect together yeah, exactly mm -hmm. the process is the health department uh, sets up the annual inspections uh -huh. so we set up the date and time that all the inspectional staff will show up at these facilities so and we go in as a team we find the operators appreciate that and we get to look all of the eyes of the various departments at the same time uh, but this year it was a struggle we've had a number of cancellations and uh, some saying that we're not ready for you and as a result it delays our recommendation well there seems to be yeah a long list that haven't been inspected yet um, do, do you think it would be helpful for us to hold this for I, I don't think so none, none of the ones that we couldn't get to have a history of code enforcement I'd say um, you know if, if you vote uh, pending a satisfactory inspection uh, getting results and I'm hoping we're going to give uh, positive inspection results before the end of the year so they'll have a renewal for January 1st okay do we um, make the vote conditional on successfully being inspected yes it, there's actually language yeah. right on the right. front page that but we what about those other two establishments that appear appear empty are we just going to uh, I think they're not on they the list they, did, they didn't file because they didn't file right. so so like us mm. not um yeah well no we, they, we they had are others the list, you know though. in the uh, restaurants mm -hmm. there's some that didn't file but we we approved them um, subject to filing and a late fee but you know I don't know if that's the same I'm gonna I'm gonna exempt those two I'm gonna move favorable action exempting 91 Babcock Street and 57 Dwight Street and uh, the the um, recommending the others subject to final inspection and approval by the health building and fire departments and uh, the uh, a filing of all appropriate paperwork and payment of all fees including a $50 late fee for the 259 St. Paul Street that has neglected to file Good. all in favor Selectman DeWitt aye Selectman Goldstein aye Selectman Wyshynski aye Selectman Franco aye and I'll vote aye no clients among the lodging none, houses none. <laughs> Well, one of them is the Children's Hospital um, place where families, you know, family oh, yeah. in or whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of troublemakers there? Yeah. Just, just no, kidding. No, I just think it's a matter of scheduling <laughs> yeah. and what no, they No, no, I'm, I'm joking. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. The Children's Hospital facility. <laughs> no, that shouldn't be. That, that's usually a, a walkthrough, so okay. we shouldn't have any issues there. Um, so then we have the secondhand um, motor vehicle um, license renewals. Police, building, and fire have inspected all locations listed and recommended for renewal in 2015. Um, Brookline Auto Body at 40 Estenwall Avenue is closed and is not filed for renewal. And I have a question about that because I thought they were still doing something down in the basement, even when the teen center opened up above. No? Yeah, I thought they were no. parking cars there, or maybe? Something. It's empty. Okay. It's empty. Okay. I, I, I to be raised that issue this afternoon, and, and I have to say, I got very busy and wasn't able to follow up. So I'm, I don't know what to say it there, because I think the same issue came up last year, didn't it? Yeah, there was some. I what I remember is that the owner wanted to reserve access to some part of the so, building, yeah, yeah. and I don't remember the details. The team said they actually controls it. Right. But they haven't filed for renewal on some. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I will note that the fire prevention approves the motor vehicles class one for Audi of Brookline at 308 <laughs> Boylston Street. I don't know. 
Were we um, supposed to? I didn't take public comment on any of these, Mr. Kleckner. Not a public hearing. It's not a public hearing. Okay. Now, remember, we, we didn't schedule a public hearing. That's why we can't talk about some of these right. things. Uh, so I'm going to move favorable action then on the secondhand motor vehicle license renewals for 2015. And um, with the exception of Brookline Auto Body at 40 Aspenwall Avenue. All in favor, Selectman DeWitt. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyszynski. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. And I'll vote aye. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to you. And I will Chair. quickly turn it over to Mr. Kleckner for uh, some board and commission appointments. Okay, Conservation Commission. We have um, <coughs> a vacancy and two expiring terms, so a total of three slots available. Um, and we have um, three members. Um, who are uh, actually four members. Let's see, we have uh, one, two, three incumbents three. and one new candidate. That's that's right. Um, I, just, I just wonder, uh, I should have asked this sooner, but did anyone ask the associate member if they wanted to move yes, up? Yes, And she, she not. did not? Correct. Okay. So again, four, four um, candidates for, for three slots uh, for the permanent members, but there are two different terms here. So I think I'm going to take the um, 2014 terms first, and I will take um, the highest vote getters for those. Wait, I think if Marion Lazar wants to stay as an associate member, then we have three right. candidates, including two incumbents, oh. right, who want to be on the full oh, conservation yeah, yeah, commission. I'm, I'm sorry, Marion shouldn't be on the, right. So uh, we, that's we right. have so a vacancy. Yeah. That's right. So there are three, and there's three, three income, but they are two different terms, so I'm going to have right. to take. Right. We, have to, we so have to vote the terms, or and also who is going to be associate. Well, Marion apparently Mary wants, wants to stay as so associate. We, yeah. Right, but we still have to vote that, right? Yes. Right. So if, if take the first. So I'm going to take the first non-associate member. Well, I was going to do the the, the longer term. So. Uh, we have two slots for 2014 terms, which will be the full th uh, three, uh, three years. And so I, what I was going to do is list three names, and the two highest vote getters would get the two longer terms. Is that okay? How about they I'm all get sure five votes? Mr. Kleckner, what's the <laughs> you can't. Well, you can't. You can only vote for two people. What are the shorter terms? I'm not sure. Uh, one's one's three-year term expiring in 17, and then Ms. Bodich is a short term because she... Resigned in the middle, so she. I, I don't think we'd give. Would well, we wouldn't give, it be appropriate to, term to think about short renewing term. Yeah, uh, right. Werner Renew the and two Matthew for their, yeah. for, for their incumbents. full three-year terms and giving the newcomer the shorter term, two-year yeah. term? Yeah. Okay, so let's do that. So right. um, okay. Werner Lowy. Aye. 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 Matthew Garvey. Aye. 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 Okay, for the 2015 term, um, Palavi Kalia Mande. Aye. 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 All right. So now the associate member, um, there's one uh, expiring term, it's Marianne Lazar, and she's interested in reappointment. Marianne Lazar. Aye. 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 All right. Trustees of Walnut Hill Cemetery have a similar situation there, but we have two, uh, two, vacancies. two vacancies and one short, uh, two, two vacancies and an expiring term, but two of the, one of those terms is only for um, uh, through 2016. So. Um, do we want to do it in the same same manner? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see. Uh, Gerard Hayes. Aye. Aye. Oh, so then the next one. Uh, these are two new candidates, so I really can't do what you were, we did the last I time. I propose Nina Brown be nominated for Nina. the vacancy. Yes. Nina Brown be nominated for the vacancy that is um, 2014. Okay. For that term, Nina Brown. Aye. Aye. Okay. That, I think that was unanimous. And then for the 2016 term, Peggy McGuire. Aye. 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 Thank you. And that concludes our meeting. And thank you all. Meeting is adjourned.